That's your Michelin counts down to green. Owen Trinkler and Jeremy Shaw will stay with me in the booth. I'm John Hindhoff. Shea Adam is our eyes and ears in the pit lane. We're live. It's Sound of Vision from VIR, and we go racing next. Virginia International Raceway, 17 corners, three and a quarter miles, or thereabouts. And action areas at turn one, the horseshoe, into the braking for turn 11 and 12, the old oak tree corners coming down Madison Avenue, and then up a little hill before you drop down at turn 14, the roller coaster, then try and get off turn 17, the hog pen as well as you can, onto that front straight, which isn't quite a straight, there's just a little bend in it. Lots of people here, the car parks are full. People have been flooding in since seven o'clock this morning. Even as we were coming in, getting ourselves setting up, there was a good line of spectators <laughs> ready to come into the circuit. Hello, everybody. It's IMSA Radio and IMSA TV together for two hours and 40 minutes of the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship at Virginia. This is round uh, number uh, 10 of the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, or at least, generally speaking, we've got two more rounds uh, to go after this one. A couple of different championships still in play. It's the penultimate round of the Sprint Championship, which will finish off at, at uh, WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca next time out, and we'll bring you up to date with that when we're next on the air. But for now, we're concentrating on this GT battle. It's a festival of Grand Touring, the Michelin GT Challenge. The cars are rolling behind the Nissan GTR safety car. Great to have your company from wherever you are around the world here at the track or further afield. Let's check in with Shea Allen to make sure, first of all, Shea, we've got an empty pit lane. That we do, and it was um, an interesting pit lane in terms of the car coming in to get gridded for our fan walk because people were playing the fuel game even early on then and also playing the fuel game. Patrick Lindsay, when he pulled out of the pit lane to do his recon lap, he didn't turn the car on until he was underneath the starter stand. He actually came to a complete stop. So everybody worried about fuel consumption, everybody planning right now for an all green race, and they are already thinking about those dreaded fuel numbers couple of stories share at the back of the GT David a little bit of a shuffle around but not much some people caught out by not reading the rule book in qualifying yesterday exactly there was never an indication given that you could use any tires except for the slick Michelins we had five teams that elected to go out and qualify on wet weather tires in changeable conditions well it backfired on them to begin with anyway because they wound up the slowest five cars on the grid but they were then moved and reorganized based on their declaration to change tires for today's race. So we have five cars starting on brand new slick Michelins, but as we heard from Zach Robichon, the pole sitter in GTD in the Michelin countdown to green, he thinks it'll be about five laps that those cars will have the advantage, and then everybody will even out once more. At the front of the frail, the GT, Le Mans cars, the factory cars. This has been, I mean, you can make a case here. I was going to say it's been a happy hunting ground for pretty much all the manufacturers. You can make a case for any one of Porsche Chevrolet, Ford or BMW winning here because they've all had their time in the sun here over the relatively recent years. Well, they have. In terms of the series, yes, but for Virginia International Raceway, that is one of the very few tracks on the calendar at which Ford has not won in the time of this program. So for the Ford GT, a last opportunity, question mark, for the foreseeable future for that car to claim victory. The 66 starting with uh, Dirk Mueller behind the wheel, the 67 with Ryan Ryan Briscoe, Ryan qualified third in changing conditions. They could be sneaky to watch, especially if it turns into a fuel game because Westy finishing it up in his shoes, John, they're a little bit pink. Ah, uh, yes, he has a very light foot when required, Richard Westbrook. And we talk about his pink fluffy slippers that he needs to drive when that's happening. You can't start to decide to save fuel halfway through a stint. It's got to be a tactic that you take from the beginning. And Richard Westbrook, well, he could do the eco part of the eco boost Ford engine equation very well indeed. Remember uh, that a few years ago at uh, Laguna Sega, in fact, uh, he confounded everybody up and down the pit lane by not taking a second pit stop or a last pit stop when everybody thought, well, he's going to be five or ten laps short. Uh, maybe he's going to be four or three laps. He's not going to stop, is he? And that was Ford's first win that they took by that. So he can be extremely abstemious when it comes to using 
the gorgeous in that Ford three and a half litre engine. Well, we're forming up now behind the safety car. Let's hope we don't see that too often. The good news is that the wide open green spaces tend to mean that people get uh, a little bit of grass in the grills and have to call it the pit lane. That's its own penalty, but it tends to keep the safety crews off the circuit. It wouldn't be beyond the bounds of expectation for us to go full green for the whole two hours and 40 minutes. Take a deep breath, everybody. Get yourselves ready to go. Shuffle up to the edge of the track if you're here at VIR, if you're further afield. Get yourself comfortable, not too comfortable, because the excitement is about to begin. Two hours and 40 minutes for the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, the Michelin GT Challenge at VIR with Porsche and Corvette on the front row. Lawrence Fantor, pole position from Jan Magnussen. Then row two, the two Fords, Ryan Briscoe in the 67 and the 66 team car is Joey Hand. Will they have a little bit of team tactics and try and put off the people in front or behind them? It's a super lineup from all 21 of these grand touring machines in GT Le Mans and GT Daytona. And who is going to be waving the flag? Well, it's not our Grand Marshal Lindsay James, it's the Michelin man himself, Bib, at over 100 years old. He's looking pretty tidy for his years, and we are underway with the second of the Porsches. Nick Tandy coming round the outside and coming all the way into second position at the horseshoe. What a start from Nick Tandy. That was from sixth position. He was at South Boston Speedway last night watching the late models. In fact, he got to fulfill a childhood dream by making the command for drivers to start their engines. He's learned something there. Clearly, with a short track background in his early career, Tandy off the line. Absolutely superb start, Jeremy Shaw, and drops in behind the championship leading 9-12 car, which started from pole position, like a rocket from a gun. Un a rocket from the pad, rather. Absolutely brilliant by Tandy. Yeah, incredible. I mean, but hopefully it wasn't uh... Uh, too uh, aggressive there at start, or too fast off the mark there, because uh, to go leap around uh, uh, three cars to move up into second place, uh, that is pretty remarkable. Uh, but it was a great start also by uh, by Lawrence Van Tour. It looked like Yank Magnussen had a good jump there did. going into the first corner, so I'm really surprised to see him uh, out fumbled at that first corner by Nick Tandy. I, I mean, just perfect timing. Yeah. from Tandy, he was right up in the wheel Nailed tracks to the gearbox of Joey, Hand. of Joey Hand as he came through. And oh, and that's that's a great confidence booster going three row wide round the outside of three cars. That's a great confidence booster for Tandy. Qualified six will end the first lap in second position. Well, we talked to John on the warm up laps, get your tires up to tip and make sure you're ready to go there. It look, almost looked like the Fords wanted to play nice to each other a little bit. And Tandy took advantage of that. The lane was open to the outside. And that's the great thing about the start here at VIR. You can get grip on the outside here I love starting a race here because you can move so many different places inside to outside and still get grip. And it also looked like he found plenty of grip round the outside, almost on the cushion, to use, a, to, to use a, a dirt track expression, round the outside of the horseshoe, where a lot of people don't normally go, but of course we've had a lot of running there because of the damp, damp conditions. Damp conditions we've had over the last couple of days, yeah. And so he got great power down with the Porsche, with the rear engine car, and uh, accelerated right out there, and they're actually pulling away a little bit from uh, Magnuson here. Uh, not all good news through the field chair, Adam, because there's been a problem for one of the cars further back down the field in the GT Daytona part of the race. The number 12 being driven by Frankie Montecalvo, the investor Sullivan Lexus, with damage that the team just had a crew member run out to the wall to check. He is going to be pitting this time around. They have four new Michelin tires laid up on the wall. This was not one of the teams that got the tire compound wrong yesterday for qualifying. So Frankie will benefit with new tires, but they're going to do fuel and check the damage first because clearly something went wrong. It looked like it was in turn four, John. There was a bit of carbon that went flying pretty high up into the air and I couldn't tell what car it was off of. Well, now the mystery is solved. And that is sitting on the racetrack at the moment. The question is, is it online or offline? And will race control be looking at that? That car we look at there, car number 12, that also lost out big time on that start. It started in the uh, second position in GTD. It came across the line in the 10th, so lost a lot of places on that first lap. Looks like it might be a chunk missing from the back 
left rear corner, perhaps. Don't tell me the two Lexus came together in the early laps. Hello to Andy Douglas, who's cool, cozy up in the south of France, watching and listening to IMSA Radio and IMSA TV. Enjoy your time down there, Andy, and settle in for what is going to be an absolute cracker, live from trackside. It is IMSA Radio and IMSA TV together, and the second Lexus is coming in, so that's both Lexus has uh, come, have come in within a couple of laps of each other. We've had the 14 and the 12 into the pit lane. Shit, Adam. It's not the 14, John. It's the 57 Caterpillar car. As the 12 pulls to a stop, there is grass in the radiator, and they're running to clear that out first. Oh, it's pretty well wedged in there, actually. They're going to have to take part of the bumper off to make sure that the car doesn't overheat. They have put a little bit more fuel into it, and the crew members have elected not to change the tires. They don't want Frankie to go down a lap, so they cleared out the grill and sent him once more, but there's still more damage to that car, particularly at the rear. So that could have been an instance of one running into the other. We've seen that before. Think back to Sebring. Well, it, it looked like a, a little bit of, maybe it was aero push from the, the Lexus. Was the contact there or was something thrown up? Uh, Owen Trinkler was watching very carefully, but going up those S's, these cars do require a little bit of downforce on the front end. And when you're going at the kind of speed, it's absolutely flat up the S's there. If you get slightly out of sync, you're going to find the grass very quickly. No, you are. And that was down at South Bend at turn 10, the fast left-hander. It's probably just it's down a gear, just a light brush of the brakes as you come through there. And you start to lose the nose a little bit as you crest over the hill going down towards Oak Tree. So it looks like you just got off in the grass. We talk about the consequences here. If you go off, you put grass on the radiator here and that's gonna, you've got to come in the pits or stop and throw the, the grass off the radiator. And what's missing is something from the back of that Lexus. It's one of the vertical streaks in the under tray, the diffuser that's behind the rear bumper and the rear axle of that car. Now, that probably doesn't sound too disastrous, but you get an awful lot of the aerodynamic downforce that pushes the car onto the ground from those diffusers at the back of the car. And it's, I won't say that it's free downforce, but it's considerably more efficient downforce than sticking a honking great wing up and putting it at 45 degrees on the back of the car. So that will make a difference to how that Lexus handles, particularly in the faster part of the circuits. Uh, certainly, I've had an incident where somebody knocked a bit of a diffuser off on a little prototype that I was racing, and you can feel that immediately. Oh, and and that, the, the big issue for Lexus is they've had issues with uh, rear tyre wear earlier uh, in the season anywhere, uh, anyway, that's not going to do them any favours on that either. No, especially not. I mean, I think I saw that at Mid-Ohio that they had some issues with that. That's not, I mean, it's important here because there's not that many slow turns here because it's just the high-speed stuff that they're going to feel that effect mainly. Already down to just over uh, 10 minutes completed. Jeremy Shaw, Owen Trinkner and me, John Hindhoff in the IMSA Broadcast Centre with Shea Adam patrolling the pits for us at VIR for the Michelin GT challenge at VIR. Don't forget, we'll take your questions, points arising, any notes that you're taking right now at the end of the race. When the chequered flag falls, it's the end of the race, but just the start of the conversation on Michelin Post Race Tech at IMSA Radio, hashtag Michelin PRT. At the front of the field, first of our Cadillac in-race updates then with just on 10 minutes gone. The two Porsches after a stonking start by Nick Tandy. Trails his pole sitting teammate, Lawrence Van Tour, by just over a second. Then it's Jan Magnussen for the three Corvette team in third. Then the two Ford GTs, 66 from 67. Uh, and those top five within five seconds of each other in GTD from pole position. Zachary Robichon crosses the line now in the plaid Faf Porsche. Behind him, Trent Hinman goes through at uh, just on eight tenths of a second deficit. Richard Highstands had a great start at the number 14 Lexus. Bright yellow car in third position, although four seconds further back, and he's got his mirrors full of Robbie Foley in the number 96 BMW. Then it's the Lamborghini of Corey Lewis. He's been quick all weekend here in the 48 Paul Miller car. Behind him, Matt Plum in the McLaren. We, Owen said, watch Matt. He's already made his way through the field to eighth position in GTD. Yeah, he's following Corey Lewis, because Corey Lewis was quickest of the cars yesterday that qualified on the wet weather tyres. So all those five cars started at the back. So Corey was ahead of Matt, and he's maintained that position and hauled his way uh, all the way up uh, the through the field there from 17th position overall up into 13th, so made up four positions in the first few laps of this race. The fastest lap there for our race leader, Lawrence Van Tour, 1 minute 41.55, the lap record, Giancarlo Fisichella and Ferrari. That was set back in 2000, 
and 17. The fastest lap of the race last year, interestingly, was Earl Bamba also, well, Earl Bamba in, in the Porsche had won 42.6. We always have thought four seconds quicker than that. Yeah, that, that's impressive. Hasn't always been the case for the GT Le Mans cars this year. The GTD's going quickly to Sheer Adam has an answer of why the MSX NSX sorry MSR NSX came in the 57 Alice Power car. She had to come into the pit lane after sustaining a puncture after being hit from behind by the 96 Turner Motorsport BMW. So that's why she came into the pit lane. It was not related to the Lexus. No, indeed. They, we were close on the track, but uh, not that close. Uh, so Owen Trinkler, the excitement, the adrenaline and all of the... Uh, machismo of the, the start of the race now has died down a little bit. Now the time to get into your rhythm and start pounding out those laps. Yeah, you want to start now. We're uh, just 10 minutes in, John. So we try to find a comfortable position uh, and start saving some fuel here. Uh, try to find yourself. Already? Not, not already, yeah. You get in, you know, if you're not in a battle, um, you want to start maybe start thinking about that with your strategist. You stay, so save you some fuel. If you're not under pressure, yeah, if you're not, if you're not under pressure, there's no reason, you know, to keep burning all the fuel if you're not moving forward. So I bet, I bet a couple of these cars are playing that game. Uh, the one in mind is I'm thinking about, we just had a screenshot of his Trent Hinman. He's got no pressure from behind. He's got the leader in front of him. And so he can definitely, he's in the best position to start saving fuel. So that was Owen Trinklet fourth position yesterday in the Michelin Pilot Challenge. If you haven't seen uh, this race, that race uh, will have that, well, the, the archive of the audio is already up at uh, radio-show.co.uk for download. And, uh, of course, you will be able to see that in full in a week or so's time on IMSA.tv. And now we're settling in for the long run here. Just under two and a half hours still to go. The two Porsches out in front, and Lawrence Van Ter is putting in a very good lap here, setting sail for the hills. That's the championship leader, remember. First and second in the Drivers' Championship are first and second on the track at the moment. And that would seal them, the Manufacturers' Championship as well, if it stayed like that. And there'd be a huge sigh of relief from the two driving squads if that was the case because then they'll be allowed to fight for the Drivers' Championship at the moment. As you might imagine, Porsche are very interested in securing the Manufacturers' Championship in GT Le Mans. They've all but done it, in fairness, but mathematically it's not there, so the T-shirts can't be got well, out yet, Jeremy. I, I, I think it is, actually, because they, they, they've got a... Now coming... they started this race. Yeah, now they started this race, yes. exactly. Yeah, they, they had a 21-point lead. Uh, the the, the uh, differential from first to fourth because manufacturers, even if they finish 1-2, the third place car gets second place yes. points. So the worst uh, that they could do is fourth position, assuming they start each of the races. Uh, if Ford GT, if Ford did his second right now, won all the races, the most they could make up is 21 points. Then they would be tied on points, but Porsche would have five wins uh, to the... Uh, Actually, to the five of, of, of four, the big part. So you'd have to go to second so, place. So you'd have to go to second place finishes, and that is where uh, Porsche would, would clinch it. Always nice, Owen, if you were battling against your teammates to have the shackles taken off, because obviously Porsche, in fact, all of the manufacturers in GT Le Mans want to win the Manufacturers' Championship. They get that sticker, they'll be very happy with that. And at that point, you know, you know, don't run into your teammates, but at that point, in some ways, the shackles come off a little bit. Let's go race. Let's you know, go race. The, which one? <laughs> Big smile. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. That. The best team wins, or the best car wins, or the best driving pair wins here. And I, you know, we were talking about saving fuel. I, we're looking at the GT Le Mans class right now. That definitely the Porsches are not saving fuel right now. You can see that they're. Uh, you know, leader just ran a 41-2, so they keep resetting that fastest time. It's cool here. There's the sun's beat down the track, but it's cool temperatures. The engines are really liking this temperature right now. How quick does this surface respond to getting a bit of direct sunshine? Sun, it, it, it's not brand new tarmac. It, it's been laid down a little while, and you, you can see from the the tarmac that the surface color it's quite a light colored grey, and sometimes that takes a little more time to heat up when there's, even when there's direct sun on it. Uh, not, not too bad, John. I mean, we did a test here in April, and the conditions are almost like they are today. This is the perfect condition for this track. Just enough tire, you know, temperature in the track, but the, the engines like this coolness here uh, that we got, and you can set some really fast times here. Uh, it was definitely the BMW that hit the back of Alice Powell's NSX and did some damage there, causing the puncture. That'll be being looked at, I'm sure, by race, race control, but early nip and tuck in the... Uh, opening laps sometimes you get a little more leeway than others but definite contact there 
between those two cars, which has brought Alice Parle into the pit lane, but she's running uh, in 12th position got out ahead of Frankie Montecalvo who had his own problems and it's all about reeling the laps off now for the British driver in that number 57 NSX there was a victory overnight for the driver that she's uh, taken the place of whom uh, whose place she has taken let's get that one right see the damage on the left rear as it goes through turn number three and four uh, Christina Nielsen winning her class at Suzuka in the endurance race there at the weekend. So chalk one up vicariously at least to MSR uh, and that 57 team. Yeah, it strikes me that team has had absolutely no Zero luck on their side uh, this this uh, year whatsoever. Anything that can go wrong has gone wrong. Intensely frustrating, uh, particularly for Catherine Legg, who, who came in here with huge expectations after a fabulous season in 2018. So, you know, she's... Uh, it's going to be an uphill battle from here uh, with that extra pit stop uh, falling half a minute behind the rest of the field it's going to be a battle but you know they're going to fight as hard as they can as they always do i'm just reminded by sheer adam in my uh, headset here it was almost diametrically opposite last year jeremy where the other car that's now fighting for the championship had no look through the year uh, and it was catherine in the 57 car who was battling for the champion i mean <laughs> racing karma i don't know how superstitious are our racing drivers when you're on a run of bad luck oh and how do you break out out of that little black cloud sometimes that's, that's over the top of you i'm asking you, oh, yeah, you had a, a, an awful <laughs> start you're looking at me season. right now we went from a polar opposite so the season we had last year the worst finish was eighth and now we just had our second uh, top five was yesterday and uh, how many races are we in this year um mm -hmm. uh, you just got to keep digging. I mean, you just can't get frustrated. And uh, we talked a little bit after our victory at Lime Rock. You and I, uh, we probably bonded tighter during this struggle that we've had, even last year when we were as winning a team. as a team. Because you got to you got to stay tight together and not start pointing fingers at each other. So in these moments here, you got to stick together. And it's funny that the Corvette team, they've had the same sort of thing over the last several years, haven't they? The number three car has a great season, number four team has, has bad luck, and vice versa, it seems like. And you can't say that they can't turn out two good cars, yeah. because when you look at the lap times of the three and the four car, or any of these cars prepared by the top teams, they're within milliseconds of each other. It's just one of those things that seems to happen in motor racing. The sometimes isn't a logical answer for it. At the front of GT Daytona, it's been a copybook start for Zachary Robichon, but Trent Hinman has just bided his time and just now beginning to take a wee bit of time out of the lead. It closes down that time around at just under the three quarters of a second between the Acura number 86, that's the black and pink car, and the plaid Porsche. Behind them, the battles continue with the cars coming up from the back of the field. Look, Corey Lewis now up to fifth position and closing down on the BMW of Robbie Foley, who had that uh, incident earlier on with the rear of the NSX. Now up behind the 14 of Richard Highstand, who's done a cracking job earlier on, Richard, and now he's a little bit of a cork in the bottle as he's got one, two, three, four, five cars, including the McLaren just coming up behind him and he's gonna oh and once again the bmw is doing a bit of bump and run and he doesn't come on he's pushed two three cars into a spin there now that all started with the 96 bmw getting in to the back of the lexus number 14 of richard high stand then it looked as though corey lewis in the 48 was going to be able to take advantage then he got sideways through has gone the mclaren but they've all lost ground there and the one that's being made out like a bandit, really, is Ben Keating, who picked his way through all that and has made up a couple of three positions. And Patrick Lindsay's made up a bit of ground as well. And I'm hearing from Shea Adam that we're going to have a, a pit stopper from one of those cars. Robbie Foley will be visiting me in the pit lane. They've got four sticker Michelin tires up on the wall. So Robbie's going to be getting fuel, new tires, and it is not yet time for Bill Power. Yeah, and that car's moving very slowly. Right yeah. rear puncture, I think, on the... Oh, is it more than that? Yeah. No, it is just oh. a puncture, just a puncture on there. That was the contact initiated. So both corners now of the turn of BMW have had contact with cars in front and Robbie will be getting frustrated having to drive slowly you can't drive slow enough really when you've got uh, a bit of rubber trying to break away and it has done right on Madison Avenue now where's it going to end up yeah it has to go off the track it has to roll off the track otherwise we're under full course yellow and if you're watching this down in the pit lane you want to bring your guys in 
Yeah, let's uh, show you're probably going to get really busy here. It's going to get really, really busy. Who gets the opportunity? The leaders are just coming down the back straight and have had to avoid that. Can they get in the pit lane before the yellow comes out? Still early in the race. It's still worth taking a free pit stop, though. Full course caution is out. Full course caution is out and nobody's got to come in. That means Robbie Foley will come in to a closed pit lane. They'll be allowed to change that one rear tyre under emergency service and send him back out. But then he'll have to pit again once we go back to green. Two hours and 22 minutes still to run here at VIR. First full course caution for some debris on the circuit. That means that we can take a little bit of a breather. And Porsche will be cursing that because they've built up a decent lead already. The Nissan Titan VIR track services vehicle, which has been very busy pulling people off wet grass this weekend, has picked up the carcass of the Michelin tyre. So Foley runs into the back of High Stand, gets checked up. Corey Lewis tries to go around the outside. They both lose it in spin. And somehow the McLaren manages not to get turned around. And masterful avoidance by Ben Keating, who got on the brakes and picked his way through that. And Foley has made his way. Oh, so there was contact with the McLaren. I didn't I thought he'd managed to get through that, but the plumber McLaren did get a touch. Foley's back in the pit lane. Shit's got to be one tyre only here. That's all it was. The Turner Motorsport crew signalling very early on. One tyre only, no fuel. Put the nozzle down. Don't take a chance on it. And he is already back out on the track. But as you said, John, he will have to come back in to serve that emergency service penalty. Yeah, and the, 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 it looks like he's going to lap down too. That's uh, annoying. Uh, just came out right behind, it looks like, the uh, the second first and second place cars of GTD. So very irritating for those guys. Uh, I, I wonder whether actually the GTD leaders were told get on it and try and put that car a lap down because 96 yeah. car uh, has been uh, super fast good this point. season. They've got a really good strong, uh, str good string of, of, of results. Uh, they're running second in the in the overall championship with four podiums in a row, including uh, that win. Uh, a little earlier on, so uh, it's, uh, it's bad news for that team, but it was all caused by the fact the number 14 car was really struggling. He was falling back by pretty much a second a lap to the two leaders, that's Richard Highstand in the Lexus car number 14, and they all kind of bottled up behind him. No action for the initial yeah. compa uh, contact there between Robbie Foley and Richard Highstand, uh, so that car uh, will, that uh, those two cars will be allowed to continue. Good news for Alice Powell here. Uh, and Frank, Frank Mont... Oh, Frank Mont Calvo, has he dropped a, a lap? No, uh, no, he should be still on the lead lap. He's just... Uh, right, he's, he's, on, he's on the, the GTD lead lap, so he'll get the wave around. OK, fine. He, so he will come back around. But good news for Alice Powell, who was the recipient of the bump and run and the puncture caused by the BMW earlier on on her Acura. She'll get to come round back to the back of the field. Pits are now open for GT Le Mans. Two hours and 18 minutes to go. That's 138 minutes. What do we reckon these cars can do on fuel, Jeremy? 45, 50 minutes for the GT Le Mans cars? Yeah, uh, yeah 50 minutes or so, certainly. And um, perhaps a little bit better than if they, uh, if they are really in fuel save mode. Well, Nick Tandy apparently, according to the radio traffic, has been saving fuel like a madman. Shea Adam, they're going to bring the 911 in or are they going to leave Nick Tandy out there? Everybody's coming in in GT Le Mans. Uh, Nick Tandy has been saving like crazy. For example, when everybody was told to fire up their engines, he did not. He waited until it was his turn to roll off the grid. And then there was a puff of white smoke from behind the Porsche, as is normal. And then Nick Tandy started rolling. And both Porsches into the pit lane. Nick Tandy will stay here. Patrick Pile has been called upon. He's up on the wall. He's doing his stretches. No other GTLM drivers, to my eyesight, are going to be doing the same. First cars that will hit their box will be the two BMWs and then the two Corvettes as the two Porsches rumble by and the two Fords. Everybody's in already. Fuel and tires for the number 67 for GT. No driver change there or for the 66. For the 25 BMW, fuel and tires. 24 is getting exactly the same service. Three and four, fuel and tires by Corvette Racing. Let's see if Corvette can keep their legendary status going. Yes, they can. 
Okay, our first two cars back out rolling. 911 looks like it's going to usurp the lead from their sister car, and indeed does, even though they did a driver change. So it is 911, 912, three, four Corvettes. Then it's the 66 Ford GT, then the 67, then the 24 BMW, and finally it's 25. That is the advantage of Nick Tandy saving fuel. That is Nick Tandy's right foot that allowed the 911 to get going first. Spot on, Cher, exactly right. The determining factor in how long you're standing still is always the fuel, because you can change the tyres and the drivers, oh, and Trinkler very quickly indeed. They clearly didn't, weren't going to need a full fuel load there, and if Nick Tandy saved just a little bit of fuel, then the fuel hose comes off quicker, the car's down quicker, and they're away. There is another point to that. They may have elected to slightly short fuel the 911 just to get that track position. Just to get the track position, yeah, you're correct, John. But it doesn't take much. I mean, you can save just a little bit of fuel because we're limited. When we do a full fuel, everybody has to run to a certain number of seconds. Correct. Uh, in each class. So, yeah, if you can save a little bit of fuel and make that fuel flow, you know, be finished and be able to get out ahead of your competition, uh, that's unbelievable. But when we have the cycle come for GTD, I'm going to be interested to see because I don't know what the tire limit was for GTD for this race, if, but if everybody just does fuel only. So six sets of tires. So depending on what they did, you know, with the rain that we've had earlier in the week, probably you know, if they sets. select to put tires on here, somebody just further in the field just does fuel only to get track position here. Yeah, yeah, and I mean they would need less than half a tank of fuel on board these cars. So uh, th yeah, that's pretty pretty sharp work to change a driver in that amount of time. And, and four tires. Yeah, yeah, yeah tires. Yeah, they did tires. That's, yeah. that's pretty that's pretty straightforward. But to get driver change done is, I, I think, is is for me the the, the most impressive part of that. Uh, they practice a lot, these guys, yes, and the works do. guys are like whippets, aren't they? They are really lithe. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be different if uh, I was having to jump in and out of there. I, you'd still, the 911 Porsche would still be sitting there right now. Going, uh, uh, take your time, lads, take your time. <laughs> I'd still be there right now. Uh, fantastic stuff, uh, as we have all the GT Le Mans teams running Porsche, Chevrolet, Ford, and BMW, and all in the right numerical order. 911 from 912, 3 from 4, 66 from 67, and 24 from 25. Ah, all's right with the world. Shit, Adam, back down in the pit lane. Uh, I presume it looks like all of the GTDs will come in as well. Uh -huh. From the bodies that I'm seeing up on the wall, John, there's not a lot of empty wall space. We still have yet to get the cars all the way back around. Both of Just the MSR down. Acuras are going to be coming in, though. The Turner Motorsport BMW coming back in to do their full service. We've got Faf. Well, Faf sort of leaning on the wall. They they look casual. I think Robichon stayed out, and yes, he did. Oh, Zach right. did not come in. Okay, so we've got the Acura, the BMWs, the, okay. Who 63 didn't... stayed out, the WeatherTech cars stayed out. Those Thank are the you. only two GTDs who have stayed out. Shit, Adam. And everybody else, uh, yep, both of the Lexus is coming in, too. We've got an issue with the fuel probe attaching to the 14 Lexus. It was very recalcitrant to get going. Everybody down in the pit out end of the pit lane is now in. They are doing fuel and tires for the Turner Motorsport BMW and both of the MSR Acura's fuel only for the 14, and it is the first one to get that going. But of course, no new tires on that car. First to the tire changers to get underway. 33 Riley Mercedes. That is Ben Keating. He will fall back in a line behind the 86, who also got new tires. Then the 73 Park Place Porsche. Patrick Lindsay making up a ton of spots. And Alice Powell in the 57, the next car to get back going. It is then Magnus Racing in their Lamborghini. Then we have the McLaren for Compass Racing. The 74 Mercedes is back out. Corey Lewis dropped a bunch of positions on that one. He is now just ahead of the Turner Motorsports BMW. And I can tell you why, Shea. He had to come in at an angle around the McLaren, and he didn't quite get close enough to the wall. I think they struggled to get the fuel probe in on that Paul Miller racing Lamborghini. That was the team that won the championship uh, in teams and drivers last year, and uh, nothing they could do there at all. They had to pull around the front uh, of the number 76 Compass McLaren. Matt Plum stayed aboard that car. In fact, I don't think we saw any driver changes there. No, we didn't, uh, no. because they haven't reached their drive time in GT Daytona yet. Yeah, there is a minimum drive time in GTD. There isn't in GTLM, effectively, in, at this stage in the race now. Uh, the number 96 car, a bit unfortunate for them that the, the one of the cars that didn't come in was the leader, Zachary Robichon, because that means the number 96 car was behind that on the racetrack, one lap down to the leaders. If the number nine had <laughs> come in 
in with everybody else, that would have enabled the 96 car to go past, take up position behind the safety car. Then before we went back to green, it would be waved around the safety car to come around to the back of the pack and potentially then make a pit stop before we go green or not. But as it is now, it remains one lap down to the leader in GTD. I wonder if Faf have actually decided to do that, to keep the 96 off the lead lap, because they might think that that car still with two hours and 12 minutes left to put themselves off strategy from everyone else. But that's a, well, it's an it, interesting tactic. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly one, one, one of the factors to consider because, as we've already talked about, number 96 car is fast and has been on the podium each last four races, including a win. Uh, but also in the, in the WeatherTech Sprint Cup for GTD, ah. Zachary Rogachor in a number nine car leads the points in that uh, championship. And the number 96 car is 15 points behind uh, the drivers, uh, Robbie Foley, Bill Oberlin. So, you yeah, very much in contention there. So, the uh, the focus for number nine car is to get as many points for Rubichon as they can. We're going back to green shortly. I know that because the GT Daytona cars are being asked to just slow a little bit and allow the GT Le Mans cars back to the front of the field. This is what's called the class split. So, the faster GT Le Mans cars go back to the front of the field. It's still the two Porsches at the front of the field, but this time it will be Patrick Pile who will lead them to the green ahead of Lawrence Van Ter, the pole sitter. Then the two Corvettes, Oli Gavin made up some time in the pit stop there, and we're going back to green. The two Porsches and nose and tail across the line, and it looks to me as though Van Ter wants to make a bit of a battle out of this down into turn one. He can't go all the way around the outside as Nick Tandy did early on, but the two Porsches are racing. They're almost touching. I think they did touch in between turns two and three. My goodness me. No team orders here. 9-11. Patrick Pile leading from the 9-12. These two are first and second in the Drivers' Championship, and Jan Magnussen must be giggling. He's been, he was well and truly dropped at the start, but these two battling has allowed the number three Corvette to halve the distance between them off at turn three. Has gone the number 44, the Magnus Racing Car. That restarted in ninth position for eighth position in GT Daytona for John Potter. He's back on the circuit though, just got a bit of a grassy moment. The howl of the flat six going up towards Oak Tree Bend. And the two Porsches then remain as they were at the restart. Owen oh, Trinklet, no team orders there. This looks like the battle for the Drivers' Championship is heating up right here. Never mind what's going on in the manufacturers. No, that was an unbelievable start there. You know, Pile, his first couple of laps in the car right here. So uh, it looks like Banthor was trying to put a move on him. He got great grip coming on the inside out of the horseshoe. You can really get a really good drive there, and he did. Uh, but it's tough to make a pass into NASCAR, you know, turn three area, the NASCAR turn on the outside. That's where he was positioned for. And uh, they almost made contact. Oh, he got a little loose there coming yeah. down through a roller coaster there. Big slide for Patrick Pele there coming down the hill. But uh, these two Porsches, they look awfully stout. They've been quick in the wet and the dry. And once again here, they're edging away already from the Corvettes. <laughs> but I'm laughing because uh, Van Ter is flashing at his teammate, the leader, Patrick Pele. Good battle going on for third, fourth, and fifth. The two Corvettes and the first of the Fords, the red, white, and blue Ford GT of Joey Hand, the number 66 car. So Hand closing in on the two Corvettes in that GM Ford battle, looking very interesting indeed with the two BMWs just behind the second Ford. This is a much closer spread in the restart than we had at the start of the race, where the GT Le Mans field got rather strung out. Still got more than two hours, two hours and nine minutes near enough here. And there's plenty of inter-team battling going on here, particularly at the front of the field. In GTD, great restart by Zachary Robichon, who's pulled out a second and a half from Cooper McNeil, then Richard Highstad in the Lexus, so that's nine from 63 from 14, then the accurate of Trent Hinman. Uh, Alice Powell is up to sixth position after a great turnaround by the MSR team. Uh, and she is right behind Ben Keating in the number 33 Mercedes AMG GT3. So we'll catch up with those battles in a little while. But at the front of the field, Porsche, Porsche, Corvette, Corvette, Ford, Ford, BMW, BMW. Then the gap back to the leading Porsche in the GTD. And Ben Keating sitting in. Uh, Fifth position has a whole train of cars beginning to close down. Ben's been driving out of his skin recently, particularly in the qualifying session, Jeremy, and he'll be a big miss next year, as will the team when they head off to the WEC. 
and race for Porsche with Project One. Yeah, it's a bit of a surprise to see Ben racing a Porsche, certainly, but uh, it will. Uh, but he's been uh, yeah, Mac driving absolutely superbly this season. Didn't have much like yesterday in the qualifying session, but uh, other than that, he's been driving absolutely superbly. Till he was driving superbly. Now it's Zachary Robichaud. Look at the gap he's already pulled out over Cooper McNeil and the rest of the field. He's got uh, less fuel on board, obviously, in that number nine car. I mean, not top off during that caution period, but still, he's running a really, really good pace. And Trent Hinman cannot find a way past uh, Richard Highstand. That's frustrating. Highstand was holding up that whole train of cars uh, earlier in the race. It was the number nine car, number 86. They were pulling away at about a second a lap, but it was defensive uh, driving there from, from, from Highstand. He just does not want uh, the uh, Acura to come past. And then the 14 car has got the oh. old tires on, so they just did fuel only. And Trent's Correct. trying to take advantage of those new Michelin tires here in the first uh, five to ten laps here and see if he can get by them. And Richard's doing his job here, Owen, because he's trying to keep that car in contention for when he hands it over to his teammate. He's got to be careful because he can't move in reaction to what the car behind does. If he wants to position his car somewhere on the track, he's got to make that decision and, and stick with it. And if uh, the accurate behind him goes a little bit one way or the other, he can't then move. But driving down the middle of the road or taking a defensive line. If he does that early enough, that's fine. That's fine, yeah. As long as he's not reacting to what Trent's doing behind him, Trent's got a good draft here as we come down Madison Avenue into Roller Coaster here and see if he tries to make uh, a break of maneuver as we get to Roller Coaster here. He's got a really good draft on the Lexus. I'll tell you what, the Lexus is pretty quick in a straight line. Well, yeah. And comes out of the draft. And, and Richard Heisdown didn't even feel he had to cover the inside there because he knew he had a couple of cars left uh, on the 86. Acura, the Auto Nation black and pink car. No, there's plenty of grunt on that uh, Lexus V8 for sure, uh, but uh, also the, you know, the Achilles heel for this car is looking after its tyres. Rear so, tyres, uh, yeah. yeah. rear tyres in particular. Uh, they oh. made big strides, you know, all of a sudden. Big battle for seconds. Jeremy Shaw and I are taken by the fact the number 912 championship leading Porsche in the Drivers' Championship has got a couple of bright yellow Corvettes all over his rear wing. Now he's holding up the train. Yes. And the 911's been able to pull away. I wonder if there's just some tire. We talked about tires, especially in GTLM, if some guys made some different tire choices here on compounds in the LM class here. Uh, Porsche keys to the race, stay on the grid. That's the good thing. Track position, patience, and the tires. And the tires in the moment may be playing a little bit of the game, even this earlier on. Big, big trail breaking. Big, big trail breaking through 11 into 12 at the Oak Tree for Lawrence Vanter. Shea Adam, I seem to remember you telling me just before you interviewed Nick Tandy in one session that you couldn't interview him because he almost had his Sherlock Holmes style magnifying glass out looking at the Michelin tires. He was reading the tires, trying to find out what story. The tire whisperer, Tandy, the tire whisperer. He was, he was just gently grazing them with his hand, just trying to figure out what the deal was. So maybe, just maybe, Tandy and Pele learned something by studying the tires that their sister car didn't. Well, there is the opportunity for them to put different compounds pretty much on each corner. They've got three compounds on the GT Le Mans. All of the GTD cars have the same. Ben Keating with in behind him, Hugh Plum, in that immaculately prepared. That's Matt. Uh, sorry, Matt <laughs> Plum. Yeah, Hugh, Hugh will be, hello Hugh, I know you'll be watching and listening somewhere. Smash and drive from your teammate yesterday, by the way. I but he's on the move, he's the fastest GT car that last lap, so he is definitely on the move here, uh, making ground up. Well, McLaren hey. had a, a win snatched from them yesterday. Uh, it would be great to see this 720 get up the field. Uh, Jeremy, in a, just a moment, but the Turner car's back in the pit lane. This is the uh, BMW number 96 here. And it is doing a stop and hold penalty for coming in to fulfill its penalty for emergency service on the wrong pit sequence. It should not have come in with all the other GTD cars. So it's stationary in the pit box for 10 seconds. Now Robbie Foley is able to leave, but the team did have a long discussion with the pit officials to learn what they did wrong for future times. Yeah, absolutely right. Should have come in on the first green flag. 
lap for that. Sorry, Jeremy. Uh, two minutes, two hours, two minutes and 57 seconds to go. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, he, uh, Matt, Matt, Matt Blood in, in the Compass uh, McLaren, he got, he got his way past Alice Powell uh, after the restart, as did Corey Lewis, actually, a lap or two afterwards. So uh, Plum now back up to sixth position in the class. Corey Lewis to seventh in number 48 Lamborghini. But great the big, battle the going big, on. Uh, the, uh, the big uh, gator there, well, Richard Tyson uh, had a great pit stop to get out ahead of Trent Hidman, certainly. He's taken full advantage of that. And meanwhile, Ben Keating, he's hanging right with that little group. So we've got sort of five cars, well, five cars certainly in a, in a pretty tight train there, and several others not too far behind either. It's almost looking like the caution <laughs> before we had the caution there. Yeah. <laughs> this, little, this group right here is uh, going at it again. Uh, at Ibsen Radio on 20, if you'd like to get in touch, Cooper McNeil with... That car's fastest lap of the race last time around. That's the number 63 uh, Ferrari as he sits in second place in GT Daytona. And the two leaders are just getting away a little bit. Uh, I think that uh, Zachary Robichon will be delighted with what's going on behind the Lexus at the moment. One, two, three, four, five cars all in a line. And now maybe there's an opportunity for the Acura and for Trent Hinman to get through, weaves to the left and the right through the horseshoe. Now into turn three, and Keating's right there as well. One slip here could be disaster. We've seen these close quarter things happen before. Through turn four, into 5A, ride the curb just a little bit, then point it, straight line it through the snake and up into the S's. One little slip here could be absolutely disastrous. Uh, and all of the top four set their fast, uh, first top four GTLM cars set their fastest laps of the race last time around. The two Porsches were underneath the old track record. The new record then stands now to our race leader, Patrick Pile, kind of a 9.11, a 1 minute 41.078. And that's why right here at this battle for a fourth position uh, on down, check that third position on down with two minutes, uh, two hours and a minute still to go. Oh, Trickner, this is why we love VIR, because you've got a big grunty Lexus, which punches out of the corners, great. No one can get alongside. It's not maybe so quick through the twisty bits and everybody's trying to find a way through. They've got a plan, they've got a scheme. No, they do. I mean, the, the biggest thing that seems like the Lexus is uh, the second half of the track, it does OK. When we get over to the horseshoe and down through the snake is where it struggles here. Because remember, it did change tires. So I think all those guys that changed and put new Michelins on, that's where they have the advantage. But you almost can't pass there. It's so tough to pass there and you got to do it clean. So Trent is definitely getting frustrated at this point. And uh, so you just got to make sure he sets him up and tries to get a good drive out of the horseshoe and sets him up getting into turn three or down into turn four. He's got a good run across the line here as they head down towards turn one and two the horseshoe this time as we're almost bang on two hours still to go it's still the two Porsches leading Pele from Lawrence Vanter and a new fastest lap this time to Lawrence Vantor in the second place car once again a new track record the first time in race conditions that the uh, anybody's gone sub one minute 41 a pass for position there but still Hinman cannot find a way past the Lexus side Whoa. by side action and the Paul Miller coming through, coming through has just elbowed through on the McLaren and well naughty. my goodness mclaren and turn four that's twice in two days that they've lost positions there with a hip check or at least some uh, contact now hang on a second two wide coming up through the snake into the s's that will not end well patrick lindsay slots through makes up a couple of positions there and there's a car in there that i think is a lap down yes there is that is the 12 car of uh, Franny Martin Calvo, no, he's not a lap down, of course, now. He's back on the lead lap, isn't he? Of course he is. So that is a battle for position. There's a bit of smoke coming, I think, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say, that is from the McLaren, it's from the, the McLaren, left yeah. rear of the McLaren. Yeah, well, he got a hefty th 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 hip check. There. That was from Corey, wasn't it? It was, yeah. That was a bit optimistic, I think, from Corey Lewis. I'm not sure he was close enough there. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, that's allowed these two, the Lexus and the Acura, to pull well away. But uh, all the time, uh, Zachary Robichaud, he's extended his lead over, over Cooper McNeil to over seven seconds now. And Cooper McNeil is almost four seconds ahead of Richard Highstand in third and the Acura in fourth. But uh, that was most unfortunate there for Matt Plum because he was definitely uh, run into by the uh, Lamborghini. And I'm sure the stewards will be having a look at that one. Yeah, it's like he got in there, Jeremy, and just didn't get mad enough room on the exit there. He had the inside, which was fine, but it's like he broke so deep in there and the car slid up off the curb and then uh, did a little hip check into the McLaren there. And it may just a little bit of smoke out of the left front there. Yeah. But I think the biggest loser was was Corey Lewis in the steel. Now he's dropped to the whole to the back past the 12 car um, and tried to make that maneuver. Yeah, the Lexus has gone through. Frankie Montecalvo 
after not having the best of starts there. Under two hours to go, so 40. 1.42 minutes have been completed side by side at the same part of the track again. This time, Corey Lewis backs out of it. So, has earned from the error of his ways a couple of laps ago. Just before it kicks off again, let's take another Cadillac in red update in GT Daytona. It's uh, Zachary Robichon that leads from Coop McNeil in second place. That's the nine Porsche from the 63 Ferrari. Eight seconds now, Zachary Robichon to the good. Richard Highstand continues in third position with a fantastic run there. He's four seconds uh, behind second place in the 14 Lexus. Now in uh, fourth position, Trent Hinman. He's been battling along there. And then behind that, oh, do you know what? Corey was nearly through there and then Thank touched God. the inside curb, which kind of straightened him up. He was three quarters of the way I, past. Yeah, I beg his pardon. Yes, absolutely. From the overhead camera, that looks a completely different incident, doesn't it? Just. Yeah, I knew he, he the car bounced him when we had the straight on shot there that yeah. it hit, you know, something on the curb and then uh, straightened him up into Matt there. Yeah, he was three quarters of the way through. Yeah, Corey, we we'll take it back. Lovely bit of overtaking. Yeah. Uh, in the, the GT Le Mans category, uh, the top eight are, uh, are separated by about 11 seconds, and it's the two Porsches from the two Corvettes, from the two Fords, from the two BMWs. Yeah, and all of a sudden now, two Porsches extending the lead over the Corvette. The, the last been pulled. couple of laps, they pulled uh, a couple of seconds away, and here is a McLaren onto pit lane. Now, wonder what has brought this in. Is that the rub, or is that something else? Brand new set of Michelins going on. Is this left side only? I think it is. It's going to be left side only and a full tank of fuel, or as much as they can get in on that car. They've had a good look around the left front, and he's set. Yeah, that was left sides only, and a nice burnout as well. Down at uh, Turner BMW, back in the pits again, Chip. Bad to worse for Turner Motorsports, as Robbie fully brings the car back in. They're putting a new right rear shock on this car, as second place in the championship when they came in. Doesn't look like they're going to be there at the end of the day. That has big championship implications there, but you can't go throwing your weight around in the early laps and expect to keep getting away with it. Too much contact there. On a, on a relatively long race at 2 hours and 40 minutes, two Porsches have pulled the pin, as Jeremy Shaw mentioned. Pile, who got the lead of the race on the pit stop cycle. Managed with a bit of fuel saving from Nick Tandy, who did the opening stint. To turn that car around a wee bit quicker than its teammate, which had come in in front. The pole sitting, Lawrence Vanter stayed behind the wheel. This means that Lawrence will probably do a little bit more work than he normally does. He normally just does one stint and then hands over for a double to Earl Bamba. But if we go green from now on, he'll have done about a stint and a half. He'll be putting in for overtime if you're not careful here. Those two Porsches do look particularly stable yeah. platform around here, oh, and you, you've got to say, you, you, oh, hang on a second, 48 car is in. This is the uh, already battered and bruised Lamborghini. There's some racer tape on the left front already. They're going to stick a little bit more on. And this car is looking a little bit pre-loved at the moment. This is going to be, I don't think, the work of a moment, Shea. Did I, did I see some jack stands going underneath there? Uh, the orange block of doom going underneath the <laughs> car on both sides to make sure that the mechanics can work underneath the car safely. Both rear wheels are off. Uh, the left rear is getting more attention, though. They're working in there. But I have news from GT. Fast will be coming in soon. Ah, yes, they did stop. Thank you, Shea. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask Jeremy, I mean, we were coming up on drive time here soon, too, for uh, GTD, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, 45 minutes, uh, where are we now? In, in, yes. Yeah, 45 Pretty minutes has, that, that has been elapsed. That has been so yeah. anytime now you can make uh, your driver change, certainly. Still this great battle behind Richard Highstand in the number 14 Lexus, and still looking at the back of that car is Trent Hinman. He will know every rivet, every nut, every panel, every letter on the back of that car, off by heart, he'll close his eyes tonight, and that's the thing he's going to see before he falls asleep. Yeah, he's just, he's fast in the wrong areas right now, so he just, uh, we, he's Trent's quick where uh, you got to be single file, and he just can't get a run on the Lexus. The Lexus is getting off the turns that it needs to, and, uh, and pulling just a little bit of gap as you come out of hog pen. We're headed back to the horseshoe, he's got a good run. Actually, the Lexus is headed for pit lane. Yeah, it comes in right now. 
And the pit board has uh, not done its job there for the Lexus year. The pit board broke completely off for the number 14. They went to dangle it, and instead it just went kerthud onto the pit lane. So they just sort of waved a stick in front of the windshield with no indication on it for Richard Highstand. But that's okay. His job is done. He's in the pit lane. Jack Coxworth will be taking this car back out for fresh sticker Michelin tires. The sister car, the number 12, is also in as Townsend Bell finally getting back to his proper job as a race car driver. He is getting four sticker at Michelin tires as well. Fueling is done on the 14 and it regains traction and gets back into action. Still waiting on Fab though. Remember, they're waiting to take their first pit stop. Both of these Lexus have just finished their second. Yeah, sort of one and a half stints for the, the Lexus cars as Faf comes down uh, in the ship of uh, the number eight car with uh, Zachary Robichon coming down Madison Avenue now. Will we see him pit at the end of this lap, Jeremy? He's getting, got to be getting close even with that yellow flag period. Yeah, he could, yeah, he could probably go a bit longer if, if he wants to. So, you know, I don't think there's any uh, dramas there. But uh, the, the, as before the full course caution, the number nine, this car, the Faf car, and the number 86 car, they were pulling away from the Lexus and therefore everybody else at about a second a lap. That's exactly uh, what uh, Zachary Robichaud is doing now over Cooper McNeil. Cooper McNeil, at the same time, has been edging away from from the Lexus and therefore the rest of the pack uh, because uh, Hidman was uh, still stuck behind, was this time stuck behind the Lexus. So now with that Lexus having pulled out of the way, we'll see whether Trent Hidman can make any inroads towards in, in the gap to catch up into the second place car of Cooper McNeil. Uh, what I didn't add into, ooh, big slide in the middle of the oak tree corner for the 66. Uh, of uh, 4GT of Joey Hand and uh, just a moment or two ago Joey Hand inherited fourth position from Ollie Gavin who got a nasty wiggle at NASCAR Bend and uh, almost went full four wheels he did go all four Michelins onto the dirt there he's managed to hold on to it and pounced upon uh, by the number 66 now up into fourth position then for Joey Hand one of the things we didn't mention our Porsche keys to the race and I feel I should have actually is fuel consumption here. I was talking to the teams, the GT Le Mans teams in particular, and they seemed to think that they were all right on fuel, but they would try and do a bit of fuel saving. I'm not sure whether there's a bit, what a bit of fuel saving means, and whether that means a splash towards the end if we go green for a very long time. And everyone was being quite cagey about telling me how much yellow they needed to make it on an exact number of of pit stops, so we'll I'm sure we'll find out in due course. Fantastic consistency from our, our race leader. Uh, all of his last, well, basically, seven or eight laps are with, with, within, well, certainly two tenths of a second. It's the absolute the most. Mm. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Uh, 41. Uh, one minute 41.0 this lap, 41.2 last lap, 41.1, 41.1, 41.0, 41.2, 40.9, 41.0. Uh, uh, just fabulous consistency at the front of the field. And but he's not pulling away because Lawrence Van Troy is still within a second of him. But the Corvette now is three, almost four seconds back in third position. We'll come back to that in a second. Coop McNeil pits, pits from GTD second position in the number 63 Ferrari. Cher Adam is watching the stop. Tony Valander climbs aboard the white Ferrari, the, the number 63 on the side, four fresh Michelin tires. Yes, they do, they do have stickers on them, still leave it. Uh, for the Italian-based team, Scuderia, of course, they've won championships, they've won races, but it's been a long time since they've won here. I have to go all the way back to 2015, to the last time a Ferrari won at this track in GTD, waiting on the fuel as all of the rest of the pit stop perfect. Now, so now fuel probe comes out, and away goes the Ferrari very nicely executed stop there by Scuderia course and that uh, 63 Ferrari heads out having given up second position but remember he stopped with what about an hour and 50 minutes let's say to go so he'll have at least one more stop uh, before the end just want to go back to what Jeremy was talking about with Patrick Pelier or oh, Trickler with us in the IMSA broadcast centre here at VIR a circuit he knows very well indeed consistency and particularly quick and consistent exactly what you want here Patrick Peely we often maybe don't make enough about his contribution Nick Tandy very fast very aggressive often does the the qualifying but you absolutely need a Peely to reel off these laps and he's not slow he's just quick 
and quick and quick again. Yeah, you just want to get in the groove. They talked about, you know, they're working on long runs and stuff. And uh, once he got, uh, you know, did the, did the driver change on that first pit stop, Pile got in and now he's gotten in the groove and he's just knocking the laps off here. And uh, they've definitely stretched it out on the Corvette just over four seconds ahead. And now they can start saving some fuel because they're not getting pressured right now. So granted, there are teammates there. They're running pretty close together, but now you want to see if the 912 is saving fuel because he doesn't have the pressure behind him. So we're going to see how this is all going to play out. We have seen, Jeremy, at Lime Rock Park earlier on this year, Porsche didn't quite get their strategy right and were beaten with some clever thinking uh, by the Ford team, who actually took a, an extra pit stop but brought the race into smaller, uh, smaller uh, chunks, if you will, to get the best out of their tyres. Do you think that uh, the Porsche GT team learned anything from that and are they likely to be more flexible on their strategy? It, it's not a factor here because tyre wear really isn't a major issue, unlike at Lime Rock Park where it really was. They were burning through the tyres there. Here the tyres are pretty consistent, as we're seeing from the race leaders who's uh, turning really, really good laps all the way through. That was a great stop there by the Ryland Motorsports team. Ben Keating, another brilliant stint. Brilliant. Uh, what was interesting about that was that he made up several positions uh, and he was hanging there right with Trent Hidman all the way up until he, he came into the pit stop to hand over to Jerome Blake and Mullins. A really good stint for Ben Keating in car number 33. A great heads up driving from Keating when it all kicked off in front of him, all kinds of carnage. He didn't put himself in danger, made sure he picked his way through and the car's handed over to Jerome Blake and Mullins. Nice person to hand your car over to, but it's handed over without a scratch. No, Job it is. Done. Yeah, I mean, the number nine car of GTD leaders in the pit lane here. And so, yeah, I mean, he did an awesome job. He was right in the middle of that hurricane, too, all that stuff that was going on there yeah. in, that bat in that battle in there. Leader in GTD then didn't stop at the full course yellow. Zachary Robichaud makes his way with the Faf Porsche down to Shea Adam. There's damage to the left rear of this car. It's tire rub from somebody. I don't know who's even been close enough to Zachary Robichaud to bother him all race, but it is the red gloves of Scott Hargrove taking over this nine Porsche, an honor he has not had in quite some time. Scott has not been with the team for their last two races in which they've won, but Zachary Robichaud has. His job is done. He walks over to the pit lane and gets fist bumps from the crew members on that side. Four stick Michelin tires is uh, Scott Hergrove still looks like he's belted himself in a little bit waiting on the fuel probe to come out and Scott looks settled now he's not as twitchy fuel probe out at the Porsche that's a good sound very close to our cameraman in the pit lane there as well I know the lens uh, foreshortens that is that Moro down there I bet it is out goes that leader the former leader and will drop back into the pack but has in terms of fuel Jeremy quite an advantage now and can go further into the race and of course has a new set of Michelins yeah that was just a tremendous stint there from Zachary Robichaud I mean he was uh, pulling away on a regular basis uh, from everybody else just trying to look at the relative lap times uh, of all of the cars uh, 44 9 is the fastest lap in the class during this race that was to Robichaud the next best is a 45 1 from Trent Hinman, a 45-0 also for Jack Hawksworth, uh, it, it, uh, interestingly. But, uh, yeah, it was a great stint and super consistent stint once again for Robichon. And, of course, Trent Hinman now has inherited the lead with the two cars ahead of him having pitted. First the Ferrari, number 63, and then the Porsche, number 9. So Trent Hinman now leads, but pitted uh, some, what was it, 14, 15 laps ago, something like that. Uh, he's got six seconds on Patrick Lindsay, who's just done his best middle sector of the racetrack of the race. Patrick's got about five seconds on Alice Powell, who's cycled through to third position in the number 57. That's the Maya Shank Racing Caterpillar sponsored NSX. Yeah, so almost an hour, pretty much uh, almost exactly an hour that uh, Robichon did before he pulled that car onto the pit lane. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Faf car getting up to pace, and now it'll be down to the, minutes, I guess. Yeah, the strategists. Now we're beginning to see some more pit stops being planned. Just looking down, Patrick Lindsay in second position will hand to Patrick Long, one of the great American road racers, and Pat Long 
getting ready to go racing, Shay, or is he still just relaxing gently on the pit stand? He doesn't look at all relaxed. He's very twitchy, as a matter of fact. He keeps looking back at his, his crew, saying, hey, where is he? Where is he? I want to get in the car. Let's go. It's time for me to go. I want to go play. And now he looks down, trying to calm his thoughts. Nope, he's looking back at the pit entrance. This is a long wait for Patrick Lindsay to come in. It will be a driver change for new tires for the Park Place Porsche and, of course, the Ginger Ninja behind the wheel. Now, you normally start the races, Owen, for TGM and uh, Mercedes AMG, but in the longer races, obviously, you have to get back in again. About how long before you're expecting the car to come in are you absolutely ready? Obviously, you have your race suit on all the time, but ear, ear plugs, balaclava, helmet, gloves, how long? A couple of three laps, four laps, five laps, ten minutes, how long? Uh, about ten minutes. So, I mean, once, once I get the call from Vardy, you know, it's like, you know, ten minutes, I want to get ready and make sure I'm ready to go in case, you know, something happens on track that may bring a caution out, the car's coming right in. So yeah. we need to be ready to go. He kind of gives us the signal that we need to be ready. And uh, we've got the first and second in now from GTD. Now, this is interesting because these guys don't really need to come in here, Jeremy. So are they just covering off the nine car in case there's any kind of problem there? Are they back timing to the end of yeah, the race? Yeah, I think so. I think you know, they can get to the end here for, with one more with one more pit stop. Uh, I, I think so uh, now is a good time it'll make it pretty much well the, the, the first stop was sort of slightly out of sequence certainly for them but I think you should be able to get to the end from here with one more stop so you always kind of want to be ahead of the pit stop curve if you can uh, so you if you're the first car to make it your final pit stop that's often strategically if there are any full course cautions can play out in your favor but here comes the 86 car out of the pit lane and he is behind at least one of the Lexus is, 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 is but crucially ahead of the 33 of Jerome Blake and Morland. Now, can he stay ahead of Jerome? He's been in the car for a little while since he took that over from Ben Keating. And the other thing is they are well behind the number nine Faf car, which has also made its stop. So that car, with Scott Hargrove on board, will cycle through to the lead of the race. Oh, no, it's Gar Robinson. Gar Robinson, of course, who hasn't stopped yet in the 74 car. There was a little problem for the Park Place car. Patrick Long didn't seem to get off the pit stand as quickly as he should have, Shea Adam. No, he had trouble engaging the car in gear. He probably lasts about five seconds off the end of the pit stop, so that's the 73. But the other car with the three in its number in GTD that's been super impressive so far this race, Ben Keating. How much fun was it to mix it up with those guys out there? You know, that was uh, a little bit of uh, South Boston Speedway, uh, a, a little bit of the uh, off-road course on the back 40 here at VIR, uh, and a little bit of uh, road racing. That was uh, a lot of fun. You know, it, uh, uh, I mean, it, it was exciting. You know, there's just lots of traffic, uh, hard to pass, which means a lot of people are pushing their way through. And, uh, you know, I got to, take advantage of that on uh, multiple occasions. And uh, how in the world I managed to not get caught up in it is a miracle. You don't get that kind of battling over the WEC. You're going to miss that kind of atmosphere, these kind of tracks out there. Congratulations on next year. Well, I'm excited. I, I, you know, I love IMSA. I love these uh, tracks. Uh, and uh, I'll be back over here. Uh, but uh, yes, I'm excited to go uh, do some WEC racing next year, next week. Uh, you know, uh, this time uh, next week I'll be at Silverstone. So uh, I'm excited to do that. Uh, it'll be a fun adventure. Now, Jerome never has gotten an IMSA win here at VIR, so you've still got a little bit of unfinished business here. And you said we're going to see you at Daytona. That's still the plan? Uh, absolutely, yeah. We'll be here at Daytona. Uh, I was showing Bill a picture this morning from uh, 2013 in the GTC class of ALMS. Uh, I was uh, I was on the top step of the podium and Jerome was standing right next to me with Cooper uh, and we were wearing our our rings that were the trophy that year. Uh, uh, but uh, I think both Jerome and I had more hair back then. Well, he certainly did. I found a headshot I'll have to show you uh, at some point. You've got your four GT sitting up in the paddock. I happen to notice that. It made my heart flutter a little bit. You haven't said what you're coming to Daytona in. Any chance it'll be that baby? Yeah, it was really exciting. You know, the uh, the GT kind of just got back to Riley's shop, and uh, it's close enough here uh, that uh, we thought it'd be fun to bring it out and show it off. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just, there's so many special memories uh, tied to that car uh, uh yeah i 
I will look forward to uh, racing it, to driving it some point in the future. Uh, don't know when the when or what that is yet, but uh, uh, it will uh, be back on the track at some point. Well, good luck today getting that another win. Thank you, Shay. Right, very good. Thank you to Ben Keating for answering the questions. Bit of bump and run going on between uh, Ford and Corvette. How many times have we said that? The number four car just getting bumped down the field and has now come in, made its uh, driver change. Ollie Gavin out, Tommy Milner in. That car with a, a, a drive light change, full engine swap before qualifying. 65 minutes out to back in again uh, earlier on this week. Extraordinary stuff. And, and just a footnote about Ben Keating. Silverstone next weekend, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Full coverage over on RS3, our sister service to IMSA Radio. Johnny Palmer will be leading the WEC. Comrades ELMS as well, the European Le Mans Series, plus Porsche Carrera Cup GP, all live exclusively, uh, free across the world with uh, the team at Silverstone. And that same weekend will give you a choice of endurance racing with the 24 hours of Barcelona at the Circuit de Catalunya. And that'll be Shea, me. And we've got Andy Marriott coming over with Paul Truswell as well. That'll be on RS1 next weekend. On board here with the number 63 WeatherTech car, the uh, Ferrari. Tony Vilander now aboard that, having taken over from Cooper McNeil. He's trying to track down uh, Mario Farback, who's in for Trent Him in, in the Acura. That is a battle, though, now for fourth position in the class. So Scott Hargrove was able to maintain the lead for uh, Porsche, the FAF team, but only by a couple of seconds over Jack Hawksworth in the number 14 Lexus. He's in for Richard Heiss and Jerome Blechemol, similar margin, a couple of seconds back in third position, and then about four seconds back to this battle here between the number 86 and the number 63. Quick note in also in GTLM, number 24 car, the BMW. The BMWs had been running in tandem, the 24 ahead of the 25. Those two, they finally switched positions, and then John Edwards in the number 24 car must have had a spin two or three laps ago because all of a sudden he dropped a long, long way back from the other car. And he's now kind of, well, sort of back up to speed again, but the two BMWs, they're a long way off the pace of everybody else in GTL GTLM. Still no announcement about BMW in IMSA next year. We know that they've wrapped up their WEC Le Mans programme, but uh, don't worry too much at the moment. Traditionally, BMW in common with most of the German manufacturers like to announce their full season international programs at their Knights of Champions, the banquets at the end of the season. BMW is normally the end of November or the beginning of December in Munich, of course. Still haven't heard what Porsche were doing either, but I uh, don't think that's in doubt. Expect to hear from those two major manufacturers shortly. Still a big question mark over Ford GT here next year and what Chip Ganassi will be doing. Officially, no Fords next year, but I know Chip's been working really, really hard to either keep those cars in on an independent basis or to find another manufacturer, and we'll keep you up to date with that once we get any more details from that. It's been a great addition to the IMSA paddock to have Chip Ganassi, his team, and indeed his drivers quite a formidable lineup of drivers that they have who uh, Chip is trying to keep together for a program for 2020. IMSA Radio and IMSA TV together. We're live trackside at beautiful Virginia International Raceway. The IMSA broadcast booth uh, just outside the Patriot circuit, which is the little circuit in the middle of the full track here. And that's being used this weekend by Michelin to allow some of the spectators here a chance to experience what Michelin tyres go through under development here. And this is a development venue for Michelin Street tyres. If you're here at the track, you can sign up at the Fan Experience Centre. There's some Michelin pods down there and get your invitation to come up to the Patriot course and uh, see exactly the technology transfer between track and street tyres. Big crowd in all along the fence line. People coming in early. They love their road racing in this part of the world. Since 1957, this track has been 
attracting spectators and challenging drivers and teams. An hour and 33 and a half minutes still to go. It's Porsche at the front of the field. Remember, just the GT field here this weekend. 9-11 from 9-12. Two seconds between the pair. Then the Corvette number three, Jan Magnussen. Then four GTs, 66 and 67, who've elbowed their way through. Then the two BMWs, and most recently having stopped Tommy Milner in the Chevy Corvette number four, dropping back to eighth position. Yeah, the two BMWs, I mean, they're a second and a half off the pace of everybody else. I'm not really quite sure why they're staying. I guess they're supposed to, they have to in terms of their fuel strategy, but gosh, I mean, that, yeah, they're seeing the same sort of drop off uh, at, uh, here that uh, maybe most teams were at Lime Rock, which is, uh, I think they're the only teams to be suffering that sort of drop off. So that's kind of strange to see the BMWs falling back by that much at this stage in the race. In GTD, Scott Hargrove continuing the really, really good work from Robichon, he's actually extended his lead a little bit. It was two seconds, uh, four laps ago. It's now 2.7, so a couple of tenths a lap over Jack Hawksworth. Uh, and in the meantime, though, Jack Hawksworth has been caught now by number 33 of Jerome Bleckermann. He's been absolutely flying. Uh, and also Mario Farbacher in the number 86 Acura. He and Tony Vilander are running the same sort of post pace as Blekemol and Farback actually has just turned that car's fastest lap of the race at a 1 minute 44.922 that is almost identical to the fastest lap of the race in GTD that was set by Zach Robichon a little while ago just That's quite a long time ago to just beginning to see a little bit of interest from the GT Le Mans pit crews again we're coming down to 90 minutes to go and once we get to 90 minutes to go, if they stop then, it's only one more stop to the finish. And remember what Jeremy Shaw was saying uh, earlier on about being the first people to do your last stop. That can often be an advantage, particularly if a yellow flag comes out. At IMSA Radio, by the way, if you want to get in touch with us here. So expect to see the leading GT Le Mans cars in in a couple or three laps. Now, the question for me will be whether Patrick Pile steers in. He's done nearly a full stint now. Will be quite a full tank of fuel. So they're, they're not using all of the tyre, they're not using all of the fuel here. But will Nick Tandy be put back into the end of the race? Yeah, it's interesting to see that. But what's also curious to me is that unusually, there's a couple of seconds between each of the cars in GT, and generally we see a train of cars, don't we? But no, uh, Pile's pulled out a couple of seconds over Vantor, Vantor's pulled out a couple of seconds over Magnussen, Magnussen's a couple of seconds ahead of Joey Hand, uh, and then Ryan Briscoe, having made that bump and run manoeuvre on number four Corvette, which has since been in the pit lane, he's about five seconds behind Joey Hand, but the first four equally spaced just a couple of seconds between them. Yeah, a little unusual for a race. Uh, we normally see them like we did to, after that caution. They're right together and yeah. they stay that way the whole stint. Yeah, they've got kind of strung out here and just depends on who's saving fuel and what kind of strategy they're on here. I'll, I'll put a, a little wager down here, gentlemen, that it won't be like that when we get down to the last 10 or 15 minutes. It's like that rubber band's got all going to come back it's together. It's all got to come back <laughs> together at some stage. Absolutely uh, agree with you. Lawson Ashenbach has been installed, by the way, in the uh, Lone Star 74 Mercedes and just turned that car's best lap. Little spin at the horseshoe for Ryan Briscoe. Oh, nice. Bit of damage on the left front of that car from the bump and run early on. Just Whoops. locked up, though. Looks like he locked up the rears right at the very end of the braking area at uh, Turn 1 and 2 there. Oh, and you're sort of braking and turning in. It's it's a lot like the first corner at Lime Rock, actually, as you, you're sort of diamonding across the corner. Yeah, you are. And it's, he was by himself there. He was just starting to turn in, which you're kind of trailing the brake into the corner there to the apex and there. And it's like the rear uh, locked up on him there. It's like you got a bit bored. He was completely on his own. own. Yeah, which is, no, he's not around. used to. Oh, yeah. Wake myself up. <laughs> he's still obviously completely disgusted at the uh, Australian performance in the uh, Ashes <laughs> Test match at uh, Headingley. He must have been thinking about that. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's thinking he about very, that. wasn't very happy when we mentioned it to him at lunchtime. No, he, he really wasn't. Really he wasn't. A sense of humour failure there. No, he wasn't. He was having a big smile, in fairness. <laughs> Richard Westbrook had been keeping up to date with it all the way through. But a needle between those two teammates with World Sport going on this weekend one of the great sporting rivalries in cricket test match cricket uh, going on in the UK at the moment Australia uh, in England contesting the Ashes uh, series 
three down, tied one apiece with two test matches to go. Under half, uh, under an hour and a half to go. So in now the window for pit stops for the GT Le Mans cars to go with just one more after this. So two more stops. So any time under 90 minutes, I reckon, these guys can come in and make it to the end with one more at the front of the field. In GTD, it's Faf Porsche and Scott Hargrove doing a cracking job. Jack Hawksworth trying to close him down at the moment, but the times have been remarkably similar between the first and second, the 14 Lexus. And he has had to do his job pretty well, Jack Hawksworth, because he's got Jerome Blake and Morland in behind him. Jerome, who was a real star at South Boston Speedway in the late models yesterday evening, qualified at sixth for the Airmain and was running inside the top 10 and he had some issues, but thoroughly enjoyed it. Big smile on his face when he was telling everybody about it earlier on. So that's the battle for second and third going down to the horseshoe in GTD. Then it's the Acura of Mario Farmback, and then Tony Vlander in the 63 Ferrari. And behind that is Matt Plum, who's still at the wheel of the 76 McLaren. So he's doing a very long stint there still with an hour and a half to go or thereabouts john's gonna be interesting to see with the 14 car with the uh, hawksworth here remember they were the first ones to come down pit road and so got bleak mullen what an unbelievable job here as jeremy was tracking it here the 33 car did on their pit stop and uh where they ended up in third to gain all that track position leader is in from GT Le Mans, Patrick Pile comes in, and there is a Nick Tandy jumping into that car. Shit, Adam. Yeah, good luck trying to keep him out of the car after going to South Boston Speedway last night. Nick Tandy like a kid in a candy store, except he is allowed to eat whatever he wants. He's allowed to drive a race car. Patrick Pile very gingerly closing the door, jumps back over the wall. His job is done. This is the duo that won here in 2015 when they were going for a championship, but it was Patrick Pile who was solo champion that year. Now, Nick Tandy has an opportunity to set things right. They are just waiting on the goal. That's a full tank for Nick Tandy, and he does a tiny little burnout getting going. A lot better traction than it was yesterday morning, though, when uh, to get out of the pit box took about four seconds. Uh, just that complete wheel spin. Yes, sorry, that, go ahead, that, that 2015 win, that was the last win for Porsche here in the GTLM class. That VIR so for four years ago. They want to uh, get back onto the top step, and certainly they're doing everything right so far. Tandy with it truncated first stint because of that full course yellow. They got the opportunity of coming in, topping the car off and sending Patrick Peel it. Looks like Tandy then will take this car to the end. There will be one more pit stop, but unless something goes awry, I can't see them risking another driver change. They're not beyond the bound of bounds of possibility, of course. At IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us, thanks for all your kind messages, whether you're here at the track or further afield. And we have Michelin Porsche Race Tech coming up after the chequered flag. Stay on air on RS2 IMSA Radio to answer some of your questions about this race and the state of sports cars in general, plus what we've seen for the rest of the weekend. Patrick Long now trying to make up a position. He's looking for seventh yeah. place, and Townsend Bell has that at the moment. Patrick Long, I promise you, Patrick Long is in behind that car. There's various parts of the circuit where you can't actually see the Porsche behind the bright yellow car heading up the S is now towards the south bend at turn 10. And the park place Porsche number 73 looking extremely good. Almost tries round the outside, coming into turn 11. Will he do the over and under? He's trying. Almost gets the nose of the Porsche in there. He is in there as they come out. That's a super piece of driving. Bell moving over towards the middle of the circuit. Very evenly matched on acceleration, the Porsche and the front-engined Lexus. Patrick Long may just have a slight advantage. They're climbing the hill. The Lexus squeezes a little further ahead. It's Nip and Tuck, who's the latest on the brakes. Oh, it's that's Move a bit over, naughty. Please. That's a bit naughty. Townsend Bell coming across two full lanes there in the length of Madison Avenue. Determined to keep that position and there was a bit of paint traded there. So for the moment, that stays even. They started side by side with Townsend Bell and his left hand wheels right on the left hand side of the track. They finished side by side with Townsend Bell having moved the Porsche 
all the way to the opposite side of quite a wide area of circuit. That'll be being watched from race control. It will, and uh, these two came out right after the pit stops. Number 73 car came out, I don't know, a second or two behind the number 12. Caught him up right away, and he's been on his tail ever since. That's 10 laps that Patrick Long has spent trying to find a way past this Lexus. And uh, looked like he had it, but it looked like he had the, the preferred line, the kind of the right hand uh, side going into the roller coaster. You've got to go to the left hand kick there. That was a problem yeah. uh, for Patrick Long because uh, Townsend Bell said, You're not coming through here. Uh, and as uh, you say, it was a bit forceful there. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen earlier on, Owen, the power of the V8 in that Lexus is the friend of the driver. The handling, maybe not quite as sharp as the Porsche, which is changing directions a little bit better. Certainly the traction coming out of the corners is advantage Porsche, but the sheer grunt of that V8, that's certainly advantage Lexus. No, big time, yeah. There's just a good drag race, and that it's going on again as we come down to roller coaster at Madison Avenue. He's there. This time, I think he's going to try to get the move done. Oh, he gets the side early. draft. Yeah, he's got position here, but the side draft's coming back on the right? Lexus. Yeah, yeah, he's coming back no, no, on him here. Is, this is the almost the same situation. Really? Yeah, almost the same situation. But, yeah. Pat Long this time says, all right, oh, and that's a bit naughty from Bell, turns into him, and Patrick Long has to do everything to hold that car on the track. Well... This that is not over. I, I, I've watched the Road America race yeah. with Pat, and I know he had an end of, uh, I don't know if he was tangled up with this car or not, it, but you guys remember from the Road yeah. America race, this is not over yet by any means. Well, that looked like the pass was done there. Yeah. And looking fairly desperate driving by Townsend Bell. Using the nose of the Lexus as a, an advantage maker. Yeah, Actually, fair play by uh, Pat Long there. He did a good job. The car's really unsettled there because you're just coming over the top of the, the roller coaster and trying to turn left. And actually, the car was pitched further left and he had to get out of it and, and catch that car pretty quickly. He did, yeah. And the lap before that, I thought Pat, you know, he's been around a long time. I thought he, he could enforce the position a little bit, but we still got an hour 20 to go. So I think he realized that. And then he got a run on him the next lap that we're going to see a replay of here that kind of got a little bump and run from Townsend there because he had track well, position This is the on first time. This is the first time where there's a little bit of bump yeah. and barging going and to on. be fair there, Patrick Long said, hey, I've had enough of this. Yeah. I get to give it to you. Yeah. So, so Townsend Bell gave it back to him once more. OK, that, that's kind of even in my book. Uh, after that was the yeah. first time. That yeah. was a six of one and a half a dozen in the yes. other. I think Pat Long was a little further ahead the next time around. What you worry about is getting one of the guards, one of the, the wheel arches bent in to the tyre, it can easily happen, or worse uh, still, getting tyres interlocked. But also, look for who's behind me, it's a race leader. That's the number 912, Lawrence Vantor, whose, whose lead has been whittled down just a little bit. It was uh, about two and a, two, over two seconds uh, over the Corvette, and so he's now trying to maintain that or even extend that advantage as they get ready for the next round of pit stops. And remember, Nick Tandy, Patrick Pillay and Nick Tandy, they dropped out of this fight and they've gone to an alternative strategy. They've made their penultimate pit stop already, and they are going to push as close to 45 minutes to go as they can before they stop again. And in fact, in comes the two leaders. Certainly the Corvettes come in, followed in by the Ford number six. No, the Porsche's gone through. Great fuel mileage by Lawrence Van Tour. So it is the three Corvette and the 66 Ford that come in with an hour and 20, 80 minutes to go. So that's one more stop for them. Another two 40 minute stints is what we're looking for. And Shea Adam is watching these penultimate stops. The three Corvette comes to a stop first because that was the car ahead and it's pit box was a little closer towards pit in. Jan Magnussen, long day for him. He gets out the King of Spain, Antonio Garcia, whose last time to win came here two years ago. The three Corvette desperately wants to win, but they're going to have to fend off the 66, which now has Dirk Mueller behind the wheel. So it is going to be a fight. Who gets moving first? Fuel probe is out on the three. Fuel probe is out on the 66. They're neck and neck. And it's going to go the way of the three by a nose. Man, that was close. They are up on the wall for the number 912 as well. And it will be Earl Bamber taking over for Lawrence Van Tour as the 25 BMW is in the pit lane. And that too is a driver change. Connor DiFilippi out and Tom Blomqvist gets in. And right out in front of the number 911 of Nick Tandy. That's a great turnaround for Corvette. Tandy made his pit stop, what, three or four laps ago. And this is a crucial part of the race as we go forward into the last one hour and 20 minutes. And Tandy dives up the inside. has got to get it done now. Get it done at turn four, knew that that was important on the hot Michelins, and he made the most of that, but he had to do it. Decisive manoeuvre there from Nick Tandy. John, Jeremy and I were just talking during that those pit stops there. 
Tandy has to make it happen now. He's got clear track. He was stuck behind the BMW, so the 912 may leapfrog him, do the undercut on him here. So he has got to be qualifying laps here uh, as this pit stop's going on for the 912. And here comes the 912 into the pit. This could be the battle of the two Porsche teammates. Here, Adam, will watch the pit stop. We'll tell you where Nick Tandy is on the track because that's going to be the key part of that. Shea, here comes Lawrence Van Turt, a hand to Earl Bamba. Hit the marks perfectly. Very already out of the car. That was kind of indelicate, the way that he threw himself out, but that's okay because Amantha Bamber could get in just a little bit faster. Rear tire change is now complete. They're still working on the front. That was an incredible rear tire change. Actually, that was super fast. Just waiting on the fuel probe. The car is still up on the air jacks. They changed the water bottle as well, and he's being told, wait, wait, wait. Fuel line is still attached. Where's Nick? Fuel line is out. 912 is moving. Where's Tandy? I don't see Tandy. Coming down the front straight now, but I think the 912's done it. He has done it. The 912 is out and away, and that being caught behind the BMW has cost the 911 the lead. Drops in behind his teammate. Of course, it's Ryan Briscoe that is leading because he hasn't stopped yet. The Ford number 67 is leading the Aussie in the light blue and red car, but he has not made the comparative... the. Uh, pit stop that these guys have. He hasn't, and he's also had that spin too, which cost him quite a bit of Good time point. as well. So I uh, don't think that car's going to be in contention unless he's, uh, they're going to need a full course caution, I think, to get back into the fray. Meanwhile, in GTD, <laughs> all of a sudden, we've got a big battle on our hands because that uh, two second advantage that Scott Hog Hargrove had has gone completely. He's now got Hawks on his cell. Here, here is the battle. He's not only got Hawks, he's now gone past him, but also Jerome Blekemolen in the Mercedes is right there as well. That's, I wonder if there's been a little mistake there from the number nine car, because he was going quite well. Well, the, the pass has been made since start finish line on this lap. Yeah, correct. As in comes the leading for GT. She Adam will keep an eye on that for us, but the battle for the GTD lead. And all of a sudden, Lexus get the advantage with Jack Hawksworth has been pushing very hard indeed. Since he got in the car, Hargrove now has the somewhat intimidating sight of the three-pointed star on the grill of the number 30 Riley Technologies car, and he knows it's Jerome Blake of all behind the wheel of that car. That'd be enough to send me off the track, I think. I might as well just put the white flag up in surrender. That's why I'm standing here and not driving one of those cars. Meantime, Ford are doing a cracking job with the Chip Ganassi team down in the pit lane. That looked like a very good pit stop indeed here for the 67 car of uh, Ryan Briscoe, who brought it in. They were done about 10 seconds before the fuel line came out, and indeed, there it is. There's Westy, who too actually struggles for a bit of traction out of his pit box. So maybe it's the fact that the Porsches are on a bit of a downhill slope that helps them get going once again. All the rubber laid down in the pit box over the course of the weekend, of course, washed away with the rain yesterday. So that could be an extra advantage for Porsche. Meanwhile, further down the pit lane, the number 24 RLL, Rahal. Lanham and Lanigan BMW has been in for its penultimate stop. John Edwards is out of the car. Four new Michelins on, just waiting for the fuel. An hour and 15 still to go. It's a long, long wait for the fuel to go in. This must feel terrible. And that one, oh, that struggled away a little bit as well. Not so much wheel spin on that. So that's a clean stop, and out they go. Meantime, the battle for second and third now as it is behind Jack Hawks within GTD. The bright yellow Lexus going through turn five in front of a big crowd on the bank sides. Lovely afternoon here, a little bit overcast, but the clouds are not threatening. The crowds aren't threatening either. They're enjoying themselves. <laughs> and as I say, an hour and 14 to go. Lexus at the front of the field. Yeah, it's been a really good drive once again from Jack Hawks with him. It was a good first at his a, down a into replay. What happened? Yeah, down to the... Yeah, down into the the, the uh, horseshoe. Just got down wow. the inside and rather caught Scott Hargrove for a little bit. Came from about four or five car lengths yeah, back. It looked he did, like and, there, yeah, and Hargrove tried tried to close the door there, but it was a little bit too, too late. late. I'd say uh, that uh, I don't think uh, that's going to be of any major interest to the race stewards. Nope. No, he was right alongside that. Did come from a long way back, but he it did. was clean-ish. He was he was absolutely there when uh, when it was time for Hargrove to turn in. Yeah, that's the difference, isn't it, uh, Jeremy? Oops. As uh, going to get a bit of help down the hill here. From BMW number 25, currently driven by Tom Blomqvist. The Scandinavian, just a little bit impatient there at the top of the roller coaster. 
Incidentally, Nick Tandy just reset fastest lap of the race, ergo new track record a couple of laps ago. 1 minute 40.781. The, the old record was 141.2. Last year's fastest lap, uh, a 42.6. So almost, well, it's eight tenths of a second and more ahead of the uh, of the, the race lap, race fastest lap from one year ago. I think we don't have to worry that the GTD lap record has been uh, hit with a very large hammer and broken into little pieces, have we? Uh, the old record was a 44.3. Uh, no, actually, they haven't uh, haven't got down to that oh, yet. Really? No, no, no. They're a little bit quicker than last year. Uh, Jack Hawks was set the fastest lap last year, 145.1. Uh, the fastest lap this year is at 144.9 by uh, Hargrove and Farnbacker. Uh, Hawks has done a 45.0 so far, so fractionally quicker than last year. But the record was from two years ago, Lawson Arschenbach in the Audi, 144.3. Very interesting. I'll have to keep an eye on that one. Meanwhile, Patrick Long and Townsend Bell continue their jousting match out on the circuit, heading up through the snake and through the S's, the lower S's into the upper S's. And Patrick Long must be trying to think of something new here. He's tried a couple of times, certainly got the traction coming out of turn 12 at the southern end of the circuit, but he's not been able to turn that into an opportunity to pass without the danger of being pushed off the track by the Lexus. Now, we've got one of the BMW GT Le Mans cars coming in. Now, this time, Pat's staying in behind Townsend for longer. He hasn't committed to which side he's going. Looks like the Lexus has got the better drive this time. Is Pat going to do a really late dive? Hasn't let Townsend know which way he's going. Fakes to the left, then comes back to the right. Really close quarters racing at the top of the roller coaster. Now, can he put the Lexus? Oh, oh. brilliant maneuver down the middle of the roller coaster. I don't think I've seen a pass for position made <laughs> there very often. Patrick Long, that was brilliant stuff. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Completely faked out. Townsend Bell, who was expecting the attack at the top of the hill, Owen Trinkler. And then he just stayed there, maybe just forced at the Lexus into trying to go through the middle part a little bit too quick and then pounced. That yeah, was brilliant yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, we had the aerial shot there as we were watching this battle go on, and it's like they came down as they went through roller coaster, coming down to Hogpen. I don't know if this Townsend lifted earlier. Just, I mean, clearly Pat had the line to get into Hogpen and took over. You, you know this place very well. Yeah. That's that's not a place where no, you normally. That's not a place that you normally pass there. Yeah. So I don't know if he just lifted there. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I almost thought he was coming to pit lane. Um, that time by it's because he wanted to make sure that Pat wasn't right on him if he made that maneuver over to pit lane. If you if you're instructing here, by the way, that is not an overtaking maneuver normally. That's not a place where you would say you'll make up a position down the left hander. An extraordinary maneuver. I don't think there was a touch there. No, there wasn't a touch there. And Long gets through onto the inside. And by the time Townsend Bell thinks I need to be turning left here, all of a sudden there's a Pat Long Porsche shaped object there at the apex and pulls out 10 cars lengths by the time he's coming onto the front straight. Did get a bit up, ah, got a big slide yeah, on. Got a little loose there coming out of the Real roller coaster there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it just at that point, I mean, these guys have been going at it. And so uh, Townsend probably thought that Patrick was probably getting pretty frustrated. This this might get heated more. Um, so this, you know, still an hour to go here, just over an hour. Yeah, just one more pit stop, I think, for the GTD cars and probably for the GT Le Mans cars as well. New fastest lap of the race, Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, it's indeed. a Porsche, but and not this, the same Porsche. No, 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 this time it's Earl Bamba. I mean, the Porsches, they've got everybody covered this season, haven't they? They haven't won the last two races for a variety of reasons, but uh, they are the class of the field this weekend. They were fastest in the dry, fastest in the wet. I think they've been quickest in every single session. Uh, and uh, in the race here, they've uh, they got everybody well and truly covered, I, I, it would appear. But two different strategies here. They've split their pit stops by, what, four or five laps between Nick Tandy well, and Earl Bamber there. Yeah, rather than singing to the same hymn book like they did at Lime Rock Park, and uh, they both got beaten there. They've got slightly different strategies here this time around. Uh, and uh, it looked like for a while there, when that number 911 car couldn't get past the BMW for a few laps, I'm sure Nick Tandy was relieved, elated would probably be a better word, when the BMW pilot finally pulled out of the way, he was able to get past him. Because uh, even the, with the pace advantage that Nick Tandy had over the BMW, who's caught behind him for, uh, well, I'd say a couple of laps, 
uh, which would probably cost him two or three seconds. No, it does. Like we talked at the beginning of the race, kind of the keys to the race. You get stuck in the snake area and up through the S's. You just got to run single file and you end up running that pace. And the BMW probably does have good straight line speed. Yeah. Um, so he couldn't get by him uh, in any areas because he'd expose the car. So uh, definitely back to second. But this is going to be interesting with the Porsches here because they did split the strategy on how, when they make their final pit stop. So we're just getting close to almost to an hour to go. And uh, they'll probably, what, 50 minutes, Jeremy, you think, come in and make that last stop? Yeah, I'd say so. And the, the number 912, this car is going to need probably a little bit less fuel than 911. They, they were, what, five laps apart on, the, on their pit stops. Which is, uh, you know, reason reasonable, reasonable difference, but not a huge difference. Getting on for ten minutes, isn't it? That's the so the yeah, true. The, it's the, just the, the, here. You're right. Good point. Yeah. Question would be for me. We know that the 911 stopped with just on 90, just under 90 minutes to go, on or under 90 minutes to go. How much further can Earl Bamba? go into the race and will that make a difference for their last stop can they do a timed stop take on a bit less fuel and go to the end and will they risk not taking tires i can't see it but that might be the difference porsche's traditionally very frugal on fuel sounds odd to say that doesn't it for the performance car but relatively speaking yeah, John, I think it'll end up taking tires. Like we saw in the, when they made the, had that first yellow, most of these guys did take tires. It didn't cost them too much time. Um, didn't cost some of them any at yeah, all. No, no, not at all. So I think they're going to definitely take tires here. The one car that I'm kind of curious about is the nine car with Har Harfgrove here. He backed up into second place. At the beginning of this race, this car dominated the first half of the race. I don't know if they're saving fuel here so they can short fill it, you know, or make that fuel stop quicker here as we make that last pit stop because they backed up into the 33 car and then the 14 car um, that's leading stopped first before anybody. Yeah, but he's not losing any ground now. Yeah, he's lost the position, but he's hanging with the, yeah. with Jack Hawksworth now is Scott Hargrove and Joran Blekemon has been unable to move, make a move behind them. Behind those two by only a couple of seconds, so he has reduced his half the deficit actually as it Mario Farnbacher in the number 86 Audi. He was four seconds behind, or almost. It's now two seconds between the second and third place cars, the nine and the 33, and the number 86 car of Mario Farnbacher. Leader coming up to the back of the Lamborghini from Magnus Racing at the wrong part of the track as far as the driver, Earl Bamba, is concerned. Going to play full of my leader. My goodness, doesn't that Porsche look really big when it's in behind the Lamborghini? Different categories of cars, of course. GT3 version of the Lamborghini Huracan. Porsche goes through. Huracan very fast in a straight line, losing nothing to the Porsche at terminal velocity. Just didn't quite have the grip out of the corner that Earl Bamba had. Newer tyres on the 912, of course. Let's take a look at how they stand. Coming down to an hour left to go. Lexus leads GT Daytona. Jack Hawks with by just on a second from Scott Hargrove and Jerome Blake. I'm all in half a second behind. So that's Lexus number 14, bright yellow. The plaid Porsche, the number nine in second. And the multicolored wins, number 33. Mercedes AMG GT3. Then there's a bit of a gap back all of a couple of seconds to... Mario Farnbacher in the championship leading Acura, that's the black and uh, pink car. Then the white number 63 Ferrari of Tony Veland is about four seconds further back. Making up the top six is the pink and grey McLaren 720S GT3 of Matt Plum and Compass Racing, that's the 76 car. At the head of the field overall and therefore in GT Le Mans, Earl Bamba by three and a half seconds from his teammate Nick Tandy in the 911. And then there's five seconds back to Antonio Garcia. Into the pit lane now. That is the leader from GT Daytona. Now, I don't think they can go to the end from here. An hour and four minutes to go. Shea Adams watching the stop. Well, it's a question of whether they can go to the end on the tyres as well, because the Lexus has a history of not being very kind on the tyres. But remember, 12 months ago, it was the Lexus that won the Virginia International Raceway. Fuel, tyres, and a race bottle change for Jack Hawksworth, as they have plenty of time to get the tire change done. The passenger door is still open as the drinks bottle is being replaced. Fuel nozzle is still attached. 
Ooh, it's taking too long on the drinks bottle. The nozzle's out and the door is still open. Passenger door is still open. The car is losing time now. This is terrible. We are up to almost 10 seconds lost with the passenger door open. 12 seconds extra that they lost with the door open. It took them way too long. That is the race gone for the 14. Well, I, I'm not sure they were in it here. You might have to go and ask them whether they're going to stop again. I think they'll have to. I can't see them doing an hour and three minutes around here. You burn a lot of fuel because you're at full throttle a long time around the 3.27 miles and 17 corners. Even some of the twisty bits are flat out, certainly all the way from 5B up to South Bend at turn 10 is completely flat in a GT Daytona. So I'm not sure that that's potentially hurt them too much. I think they'll need a splash at some stage before the end of the race. Owen Trinkner, you were watching that very closely indeed. Little things executing in the pits, and that car still doesn't actually seem like it's up to speed. Getting uh, up there. No, no, it doesn't look like he's up to speed at all. No. I wonder if he hasn't got his belts on or something. Oh, he's no, no, he's been in the car for a while too. Oh, so yes, that's right. He didn't get in yet. But it's little things like drinks bottle changes that can make a big difference. That was 12, 13 seconds stationary in the pit lane that's a huge amount of time to make up on the track yeah definitely something's going on with that car it's definitely not up to song yeah and uh that, that took way too long to lose 10 seconds on pit road it's an eternity especially under green flag conditions yes good point let's go back to share adam who's been chatting to the aim vasa sullivan team for the lexus number 14 that we've just seen in the pit lane for jack hawksworth they added a battery they didn't bother taking the old one out but they noticed that their battery power was almost gone which means that there's a bigger issue because there's something wrong with the alternator they just disconnected the old one and connected the new one ah that will explain why the lights have just gone on on that car as well now they've gone off again uh, i'm not sure they've quite got that right to be honest but it is closer to top speed if not at top speed so alternator problems then the car not charging and a new battery adder it's IMSA rules that you have to start the car under its onboard starter and under its own power you can't use a jump battery to get the car started if you do you have to bring it in shut it off and then run it again so well he's gone through he's gone through and they'll be checking all the data and asking the driver to read off the battery condition. But there is a car, perhaps then, out of contention for very different reasons. There's Jeff Willis there. Uh, Jeff and Ian Willis, along with Andrew Bourdain uh, and Jimmy Vassar and, and Sully Sullivan, the uh, principals there of Aim Vassar Sullivan Racing. And that's been a little bit unfortunate because it's been a really, really good run for this team. A good first hit by Richard Highstand, particularly to keep those other cars behind him. And since then, Hawks has been flying and running. We, we, talk, we, we talk about the car losing pace later on in the stint, but it really wasn't during that stint. No. And I think that was he, he came in much earlier than he anticipated. Uh, so the car was running beautifully up until then. It's a great shame because it's been a really, another excellent performance by the team that won the opening two rounds, let's not forget, of the IMSA WeatherTech Sprint Cup. That was both at uh, Mid-Ohio and at Detroit. Uh, and there's still only five points behind Zach Robichon. Uh, that pairing coming into this round with just here and one more race at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca to go. And Robichon's car is leading the race at the moment in the hands of Scott Hargrove, but he can't relax at all because just four tenths of a second behind is the wins AMG number 33 and then sitting in in third position and closing and closing Mario Super Mario Farnbacher. I'm sure he loves us saying that. And all about of a, him. Yeah, all of a sudden Mario started to close in on this pair yeah. and pull away from Tony Vlander because the gap from uh, the number 86 car to number 63 Ferrari that was pretty stationary around about uh, a couple of seconds or maybe two and a half seconds. Yeah, about a couple of seconds for a long, long time. But all of a sudden it's ballooned out to five seconds. It's doubled in the last three or four laps. And I don't think that's because Mario has picked up the pace. He's, he's running fast all the way along. It's because uh, Tony in a Ferrari has lost some pace. Uh, and I'm afraid Jack Hawksworth is back into the pit lane that uh, series battery replacement fix hasn't worked and the back of the car coming off. I think they're going to have to have a look at the, it seems odd seeing having a look at the alternator, but it, it's quite probable the alternator is driven uh, from a belt or a drive of the back axle. 
And the plexiglass window is coming out. Shea Adam is down there, and they're looking at something on the, the top of the diff by the look of it. They've got two mechanics actually laying on top of the car so that they can reach inside. The McLaren number 76, the Compass Racing McLaren, is in. That will be Matt Plum finally getting out and Paul Holton getting in. Everything else is routine there. They are taking off a number of panels in the inside of the engine compartment, though, to get towards what they need to. And now I can actually just see the legs of one of the mechanics from the back of this car. Not the engine compartment, I'm sorry, the back of the car, the engine being in the front of this car, as uh, the big hood is there, as sticker tires, by the looks of it, for the Compass McLaren, as the work goes on at the 14 Lexus car that was leading not too many minutes ago, has indeed gone down one lap and will soon go down two. Yeah, lovely stop for the Compass McLaren, Paul Holton installed in that car. You got all of the work, the driver changed the tires, all done long before the fuel hose came out. Hello to Rob Chalmers, watching the closing stages on IMSA TV on a very hot and humid evening at Kusadis in Turkey. Enjoying himself out there. Rob, thanks for tuning in and spending some of your Sunday evening at, what, nearly 20 past nine as it is out in Europe at the moment. Still just on an hour, 57 and a half minutes to go. Porsche one and two with the 912 and the 911 in that order. Four and a half seconds between them. Tony Garcia, eight seconds further back, but keeping, check that, six seconds further back, but keeping the two Porsches honest. I wonder how hard the Porsches are having to push. Is it harder than they want to? Ford in fourth place, Dirk Muller, just a couple of seconds back from the number three Corvette in the 66 Ford, that's the red, white and blue car with the 2016 Le Mans winning livery on that car. Then Tommy Milner, the second of the Chevy Corvettes on a slightly different strategy there. Molly Gavin coming in early after some contact from one of the Fords. It was the 67, wasn't it? Uh, which Richard Westbrook is now in, taking that car to the end and that's the next car up in sixth position. And about 30 seconds between the top half dozen, that's nothing and can disappear very quickly. If the safety car comes out in GTD, Porsche number nine, the FAF car from the Mercedes number 33. So the plaid Porsche from the Wins Mercedes, the 86 Auto Nation, black and pink Acura in third, then the white WeatherTech Ferrari, then Patrick Long in the dark grey, number 73, Park Place Porsche. And Townsend Bell, now the best of the Lexus drivers in sixth position. Catherine Legg, just closing in on Townsend a little bit that time around in the Acura number 57. That's the Caterpillar car, she's in seventh position. Yeah, and Andy Lally is closing on, on Catherine as well, which should be interesting yeah, if and when that happens. Yeah, both closing in on Townsend Bell. I can see that ending in tears. <laughs> Get all three of them. Together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that could end up in uh, sweepings up of carbon fibre there. Uh, Jerome Blinkerman, I just mentioned him in uh, riding high in GT Daytona. That's Wins Mercedes here. Adam now into the pit lane. Fuel and stickers for Jerome, so he'll be happy about that. We've also got two. Do you think we can go from here? Bill Bradley seems to have a little bit of a grin on his face, and he doesn't normally do that unless uh, he feels confident about the work of his crew and the ability of his car and driver. Fuel nozzle is still attached as the number 12 is now entering the pit lane. Have to, nope, now it's cleared the 33, so even if the 33 choose to left, it will have nobody in front of it. So that's the good news. 96 Turner Motorsport BMW also in. That is getting Bill Oberlin and the 48 Mercedes and Lamborghini. Now has Brian Sellers as the 33 perfect service, and away she goes. Just had a very interesting uh, tweet from uh, Fair Use. It says, uh, watching with great interest what's going on at VIR, but got a bit of a difference of opinion in the household. My wife thinks the Lexus grill is fabulous. I think it's dreadful. Is this fight material? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I, I don't Beauty give out is marriage. Beauty the eye of the beholder, right? Yeah, we're all very good, Jeremy. Very good, very diplomatic. Meantime, racing on track, out of the pits. The couple of cars just getting back up to speed, but going through now, Catherine Legg and Andy Lally in the... Uh, These two not yet made their next no. pit stop, so this is the battle for fifth position right now. At the... Uh, 96 car, many laps down. Well, several laps down. At the oak tree turn, two mid-engine, svelte coupes, very oh. 
very, very evenly matched, it would seem, on top speed, the NSX oh. and, the, and the Lamborghini. All of the GT Daytona cars, aren't they? Uh, they've done a remarkable job, I think, in uh, balancing the performance of these cars, and uh, there's not much to choose between any of them. Regularly, we see eight or nine or six or seven, certainly different manufacturers in a row on the timing charts, and uh, as usual here, the same, same thing, and it's been a good battle. Uh, there's been lots of good battles in this class all the way through this race. GTLM's rather boring by GTLM standards. Uh, there's no real close battles going on there at all. The best, Yet. the closest between any of them is, is a couple and a half seconds. Not the case in GTD. Yeah, that's yet. I'm still going to say yet first because fair comment. I, th there's still pit stops to, to be to be done, and I'm not entirely certain that everybody's got the same thoughts about their final pit stops. VIR. Beautiful place to come any time when there's a motor race on, even better. 44 cars in the pits, by the way, as is number 63 for Tony V. Lander. 53 minutes remaining. So that's uh, Andy Lally in the 44 Lamborghini Huracan coming into the pit lane. And presumably that's a full service shit, Adam, for those cars coming in now. Yes, sir, it is for both Andy Lally and Tony Valander, who came in in the Ferrari that was fuel and tires. For Patrick Long, it's an unconventional call to pit lane because he does not have radio communication with the team. He cannot hear them. And so they just ran out to the pit wall with their bright yellow pit board that they normally just dangle in front of the car to signal Patrick to say, um, come in, you're going to need some fuel, as uh, has gotten the radio call for first and and second in GTD, the Fast Motorsport Plaid portion number nine. Scott Hargrove is into the pit lane and right behind it, I think right behind it because he couldn't actually see Mario Farnbacher. He was so close to the tailpipes in the number 86 MSR Acura. So the number nine is first. They are doing new Michelin tires on that car, brand new. They still have stickers on them as there's a little bit of debris on the front straight all the way over to the right-hand side of the track. I think it's well enough off the line. Fuel and tires going on for the 86 Acura as well. Who is going to get their service done for? And into the pit lane does come Patrick Long and the number four Corvette. So Faf needs to leave soon or else his exit's going to be blocked. It's going to be blocked. It's going to be bad for the GTD leader as he tries to pull out because now he's got a bright yellow Corvette right in front of him. They're waiting on the fuel nozzle to come out. Let's make sure that he gets clear of the Corvette, but it will be a clean exit for the 86. The 9 is released, and he does manage to get the steering lock all the way over, but the 86 is rolling first, and Super Mario gets back out on track ahead of his Canadian nemesis. Yeah, that's interesting. That is a position change in the pit lane. And Mario Farnbacher then gets ahead of the car that was leading GT Daytona. Here comes Blake Amorland in the picture as well. And Blake Amorland's going to go through. Yeah, he stopped a couple of laps ago, so his Michelin's are completely up to temperature We've now. We've seen him do this before, Jeremy, yeah. time and time again. He's very good at getting temperature in and uh, pressure into the Michelin's. He's got to get past the Faf car. If he's going to do it now, great defensive driving by Hargrove into turn four. The tricky little left-hander now starting to climb through 5B. Here comes Farnbacher. Uh, here comes uh, Blinkermolling, excuse me, in the AMG. There was a chance there, but he was very fair, Owen. He didn't press that uh, too much. That could have been disastrous for both of them. No, it could have, John, and now he slowed his momentum now. He came through the snake, now through the S's. Now Scott's getting some temperature in the car. As we get the oak tree, he may be, in, uh, be able to hold on to this position here. Nick Tandy much closer to Earl Bamber as they went through last time. A number of people loving the look of the 720 GT3 McLaren. Distinct look of a 90s GT1 car, completely agree. Meantime, the power of the AMG, my goodness me, just blows by. That was very impressive. That's down to a little bit of better traction, I would have thought, coming out of yeah, Oak Tree. That, that, John, that's exactly what that was out of Oak Tree. Just a little bit better traction there, and uh, it'll take it a couple laps here for Scott to get the temperature in there. I thought he was going to be okay if he got to Oak Tree, but uh, Jerome made that look pretty easy down the back straightaway. Now, Jerome's got to try and catch that 86 car, and Mario Farnbacher as it is up the road a little bit. It's made a bit of time. Bless you, Jeremy. And heading down towards turn one through the kink right now with the green number one illuminated on the number panel on the side. That tells you that it's leading, and it's leading in the green class, which is GTD. The positions in GT LM, LM illuminated red numbers on the sides of those cars. Blinker Mullins closing in. 
I'll tell you what, the Ferrari of Tony Veland is not that far behind, and he's got Lawson Aschenbach right under his rear wing as well. So the top five in GT Daytona are only six seconds apart with 49 minutes to run. Yeah, Aschenbach actually owes us a pit stop, but he's been running well since taking over that car from uh, Gar Robinson. Uh, but everybody else, all these other guys, they are very much in contention for this class win. There's just, what, five seconds or so covering the top five, four cars. And then, thanks to Townsend Bell, a big gap back to uh, the number 73 car, Patrick Long. Yeah, I think Patrick will be ruining the issues that he had trying to get by Townsend early on. And the 33 car's got to run on the 86 car. I think he understands he's got to make the move now as the tire tip's coming up for the Acura here. He's got to get alongside of him as he does come into Madison Avenue here. But he's on the wrong side coming for a little kink, but I think he's going to clear him so easily here. What's happened to number 9, 12 car last few laps? He had a very handy four and a half well, second lead. Now I, I it's did, not. I did mention that Tandy was coming. Well, yeah, yeah and, I mean, the, the gap came down all of a sudden on one lap from 4.3 seconds to 2.6. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden now it's gone to next to nothing. So that's very uh, strange because it's only uh, 17 laps into the number 912 car's stint. Uh, yes, the 911 has been out there longer, hasn't it? So Nick Tandy's got a lighter car. Nick Tandy due to stop actually within the next two or three laps, I would think, because he came in just on the 90 minute mark and I would expect him to stop somewhere around about 44, 45 minutes to go, which is a couple of minutes away. Therefore, just a couple of laps away. Great run by Blinger Morland, who now leads in GT Daytona. Did we see that? Yeah. Okay. Went oh, yeah, through. good run, motor faster. Yeah, motor no, no, no. faster. Yeah, yeah is it going into, into uh, roller coaster? Yeah, yeah, yeah same, 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 same move. Same yeah, same move, same, yeah. move, same yeah. spot. So, new leader in GT Daytona. Had to get it done, had to get it done quickly. While he's got the performance advantage in those brand new Michelins. Great run early on by Ben Keating. It's all very well, you know, the glory laps done by the second driver, but it's got to be a car handed over that is able to fight. And when you put it in the hands of Jerem Blake, Blake them all, I'm pretty, pretty certain that so long as it's got four wheels and a semi-functioning engine, he'll give it a go. But Ben Keating did a great job early on, avoiding some carnage around him and passing the car over in good shape. Just look at the lap times of, uh, of Earl Bamba. I mean, all of a sudden now he's doing, he's done, what, three, four laps in the last five have been 42 mids or highs. Uh, 42 as he was doing, low 41s or, or, or 41s in any case. He's lost some pace all of a sudden at number 912 car. I don't know whether he's Tandy's just dropped back to a 42.9 as well. Yeah, well, so that's maybe... because he's stuck behind the right, other okay, car. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I think Tandy's pitting shortly. I mean, he, he was last in the pit on, on lap number 40. We're working last number 63 now. Uh, down in the Porsche pits, uh, the observations of Shea Adam might well... Uh, contradict what I've just said there, Shea. Yeah, there's a couple of guys eating bags of crisps and walking around with their gloves <laughs> okay. off. And yeah, I mean, there's some stretching, some some leisurely prep going on, but definitely not within the next 10 minutes. OK, so that's going to take them both down somewhere towards 35 minutes. Nick Tandy squeezes by into the horseshoe. The McLaren 720, that car that has such a look of the 90s GT1, as in, oh, last pit stop then for Tonio Garcia, the Corvette, and the Ford follows it in, Dirk Muller, the 66. This will be their last pit stops. They've done their last pit stops first, Shea Adam. And they're the two that came in together the last time, remember, the 66 and the three were in on the same lap. They were doing the exact same service once more, and it was the three who got out first the last time. Let's see if the Ford can do a little bit of redemption. It is four tire change on the Ford, four tire change on the Corvette. Corvette is off the air jacks first, but now the Ford comes down to match it. Fuel probe out on the Corvette, fuel probe out on the Ford, and momentum goes to the Corvette once more. And once more, they're separated by about a nose. That's but, twice but the first each other out. There was three seconds between them when they came into the pits, or had been on the previous lap. Uh, so uh, the number 66 cars made up a, a fair bit of ground uh, on that lip, 
in that oh, battle during the pit stage. and now he's slid wide, he's braked too late. Yeah, cold Michelin tyres, no tyre warmers allowed, and a mistake by Tom, uh, by Tony O'Mark Garcia has allowed Dirk Muller through, you don't give Dirk Muller that kind of opportunity, and he was through, dashed through it, door was opened, and he was through it immediately. Now, Shea Adam, that may well have concentrated the minds of Porsche. Those two pit stops, those were the last two pit stops for those guys were inside the window to go to the end, and notwithstanding the mistake by Garcia, which has given away the, the, uh, the position there to the Ford, are Porsche ready for action? Well, Tandy's in the pit lane. He's about to be, oh, wow. which means he's about to be to the mechanics. And there were a lot of guys who looked quite sad as they put down their snacks, being called into action at the last moment. This is fuel and for tires. They're doing the left sides first. Left side tire change done on the front and the rear. Now they run around to do the right side tires. The fuel nozzle still attached. We are up to 12 seconds worth of fuel being dumped into this car. Wow, perfectly executed uh, tire change. They are waiting for the last little bits of fuel as that's a rumble of Lawson and Oshenbach. <laughs> 23 seconds worth of fuel went into that car. That's all it took to get it back to full, but that's all it'll take to get it to the end. Yeah, 23, 43 minutes to go. 23 seconds. 23 seconds. And I think that'll be a wee, that's going to be a wee bit more than the, well, 90, than the 912 yeah, car this, needs this by what's, five or six what, laps. What's going to be interesting here now, I mean, Earl Bamber still only doing 42, 40, 1 minute 42s, whereas he was doing 41s all the way through. And even in the, in the previous stint, the uh, the number 911 car, well, both of them, they were doing 41s all the way through to the end of their stint. So Earl's losing, losing ground here. The undercut could well work out in favour of Nick Tandy. Earl's going to have to get a move on before he makes his stop. Fly the ointment here might be Richard Westbrook. He's now in second position. He's 30 seconds behind Earl Bamba. Uh, but I presume he's still got another pit stop to make. Yeah, he's still got one more yeah. to go. There yeah, he, he can go quite a lot, quite a bit further than everybody else. He'll stay out there probably, probably for quite a long time. Well, he might as well stay out as long as he can now on the fuel, because that's the only chance of him making it if they get a full course caution. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, I think he's, yeah, he's going to have to do an hour and 10 minutes or so. Yeah, I mean, they have to get a long caution here. If, if the memory, if once we go under side 30 minutes, if we get a caution, the pits close. So yeah, they won't be able to pit yeah. there. So here in the next 11 minutes, they're going to play their hand on what they're trying to do here. So Tandy gets out ahead of the battling Ford and Corvette. So that's first job done. Uh, how quickly will the 912 team respond? Those are the championship leaders, remember. Tandy and Pele really want to win another race. They want to get back on terms with their teammates. Meantime, that battle between Ford and Corvette getting very close indeed as they come to the top of the roller coaster. Down the inside for Tommy, he's hit the Ford, he's turned him round. And he's turned them both off the circuit at the top of the roller coaster for Tony, or excuse me, it was Tony Garcia uh, on the number 66 car of Dirk Muller. Wouldn't have expected that. Tony was not that uh, type of driver. I th he went for a gap that really wasn't there, and he's going to have to pit the Corvette. He's got a load of... A lot of grass there on the radiator the front, there. Yeah. He might be able to get it off down here in the horseshoe, maybe when if he brakes, brakes hard really enough. hard, yeah. <laughs> well, that has to be looked at by race control. They'll normally turn around the decisions really quickly. Race control has been exemplary this weekend again. Yeah. Almost coming to a stop. Tommy Milner gets rid of most of it on the inside of the corner. <laughs> on, yeah, on the apex of the corner. Do you know corner. what? That's actually, he's, he's still, I might lose the position. He's defending to the left and then to the right. He might be making his situation even worse here. Goes wide at turn three. What he has done is slowed down the forward and allowed his teammate back into this. Tommy Milner, 40 minutes to go, under review that incident at the top of the roller coaster. Now, what about Earl Bamba as these two continue the battle? Three of them now. It looked like Tandy when he made his pit stop. He had a GTD car of Aschenbach there, and Aschenbach let him go before he got in the snake, which was critical because it, it, had, it didn't see any traffic when we were on the onboard there ahead of him. So maybe he's really putting some laps together here as we kind of do the over undercut here. Who's that? Uh, Tandy when Tandy he made the pit stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he got by Aschenbach right away before yeah, he got yeah. to a critical point in the track. This is a fair point from Bert uh, Hendrickson at IMSA Radio. He says Garcia and Mystic, something is not right in the world today. Absolutely right. Absolutely right, Bart. So unusual. Meantime, now here is Tommy Milner. This time, at the same point of the circuit, trying to make the pass on the Ford. Yeah, but the Ford's very, very late on the brakes there. 
Yes, very late indeed. Very late indeed. Shea Adam down in the pit lane. We've had one Porsche pit stop. The 911 is the leading car of the, the cars that has made its final pit stop. What's going on with the championship leader? They are up on the wall waiting for that car. If not this lap, then the next one round. But the entire crew is there. They have four new tires, although they look like they might be scuffed rubber. They're not as reflective as shiny new Michelin. So it will be tires for Bamberg when he comes in. Just had a chance to review the incident at the top and uh, that's uh, being looked at at the moment as Earl Bamba comes in from the lead. No action. Mm, all right. You know, John, what I was thinking, we're just watching replays of this, that uh, maybe there was a couple moves by the Ford there down yeah. the back straightaway, and maybe that's why race control said no action there. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. There was a fair bit of, sort of moving around on the straightaway. They're trying to kind of intim intimidate the other guy. Uh, and uh, I think you can... My take on that, it wasn't, an, it wasn't an intentional move from Garcia. He kind of saw the door open uh, because the other car had been moving around a fair bit. Yep. So it's, and the, by the time he stuck his head, he tried to get out of it. He locked up the brakes to try and avoid the contact. Wasn't able to do so. Pit stop. Fuel and tires for the 912 Porsche. Earl puts the car in gear before the nozzle is removed. Very far. Now it comes out. And Earl is gone. Where is Nick? There's Nick. Oh, my goodness. They're going to be right together. Tandy with hot tires. He goes around the outside of Bamber. The lead goes back to the 911. Yeah. I think they I stayed out a couple yeah. of laps too long. They put scuffed tires on the 912. That's the championship lead. No team orders from the Ford, uh, from the Porsche GT North America team. So Tandy back to the lead. Kind of feel that uh, Nick will think he deserves that one after the demons start around the outside, making up all those positions to get into second place. 37 minutes to go. 37 minutes to go and into the pit lane comes the leading car, which is Richard Westbrook. So this will be his last stop. He'll be coming in next time around. So nine seconds that car is in the lead at the moment. How how close was it? Not close, Not at, close all. at all. Yeah, Jeremy, no. I'm shocked that uh, the 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 912 did pit sooner after the 911 yeah. car made its pit stop because they were good to go. They're inside their fuel window because he's on new tires. Tandy is putting qualifying laps in, and they're just losing time at that point. Particularly as number 912 had clearly been struggling, he wasn't able to do the same lap times as he was earlier on. So yes, I completely agree. There's GT only. But what a battle in GTD, well, by the way. I, I, just what I was going to say, Jeremy, yeah. these GT only, I know people love the big bang and prototypes going round it, the old Audi LMP paces. But you've got to say, we get a lot of green flag racing. We see guys having to work hard behind the wheel, guys having to work hard uh, on the wall as the Ford comes in for Richard Westbrook for his last pit stop. GTD still bleak of all in. Mario Farnback, Scott Hargrove and Tony Vlander all battling it out. They are only two seconds apart as Westbrook comes in for what looks to be a time, timed stop shit. I love seeing somebody staring up at the pit wall to know when they need to hit the fueler with the broomstick handle. And that's exactly what's going on for Richard Westbrook in the 67 Ford GT. It was 19 seconds worth of fuel for him. So a little bit less. He's jumped everybody. They're just coming down the front straight now. There's Westy gone. There are the Corvettes and the other Ford. Yeah, that's good. Needed less fuel. Got the tire changes done. Back themselves in that one. Chip Ganassi Ford racing. And that's a fabulous turnaround. And they will come out in third position. Now Westy's on scuffed tires. Everybody else are getting their tires up to temperature and pressure. But now here's the GT Le Mans race we were hoping for. I said it would come back together. It has. The two Porsches are up the road, separated by four seconds. And then we've got this great battle and through straight away. What a manoeuvre for Tonio Garcia. Well, might have been a slight mistake from Garcia when he went through on one of the four. And we've got three wide at the bottom of the S's. This will not end well. Oh, my goodness me and the two Corvettes have swept past the two Fords in two or three corners. That was decisive driving from Tonio Garcia. He's now up into third position. What a what a piece of pit work by the Ford Chip Ganassi team, but it hasn't really worked for Richard Westbrook because he got jumped 
by a very determined Garcia. And then following him through, Tommy Milner. That's very aggressive and decisive driving. Absolutely fair, though, by the two Corvette drivers. No, it was great. But Milner had the momentum coming out of the snake, out of the slower S's, up to the bigger S's, up underneath the Nissan bridge. Uh, Westbrook put a block on his teammate, and that slowed them both down. And then Milner just had the momentum to go by both of them before he even got to the uphill S's. So just awesome driving by these guys. And uh, I was surprised Westbrook left that door open as much as he did into the snake there. Yeah. You know, that, that's an area that you can kind of shut the door on somebody and uh, not let them through there. Two Corvettes now crossing the line. Heading down towards turn one, the distinctive rumble almost sounds like a World War II fighter aircraft, that low thrum of the Corvette V8. We're going to miss that, aren't we? When the if and when the new race car comes, no announcement from that yet for the mid-engine Corvette. Wait to see when that announcement is made, and when we will see that car, WEC starts next week at Silverstone. And if they want that car at Le Mans next year, the mid-engine car, that it needs to be homologated before then for the FIA WEC, otherwise they'll have to use the front-engine car at Le Mans next year. Interesting conundrum for Corvette racing. Yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? Uh, this, uh, this battle here, third... Uh, third and fourth and fourth and fifth, the two Fords uh, in, four, in fifth and sixth, the two Chevys in third and fourth. But the battle of, of the race right now is in GT Daytona because we've now got a four car battle and it's not different manufacturers, it's not uh, team by team. It's Mercedes, Acura, Porsche, Ferrari absolutely knows the tale. Yeah, all within uh, two seconds of each other. It's magnificent, isn't it? All come back together at the front of the GT. D Daytona field and the GT Le Mans field from third on down. Pick any yeah. one of four for the yeah. last podium position yeah. there. And I think if Patrick Long had been able to get past the Lexus of Townsend Bill earlier on, we might have the, another Porsche in here as well. Yeah, he's 20 seconds plus, further back. Plus Hawks with the course before he had his problem yeah, in good the number, number 14 car. And uh, Vlander showed some speed here in this last stint here. He he in the middle stint, he kind of fell off there a little bit from the leaders, but now he's really closed back in. Just heard from Corvette Racing. Their drivers in third and fourth, in the three and four, in that order at the moment, Tonio Garcia and uh, Tommy Milner, they are cleared to race. They've yeah. been told they are cleared to race, but no contact. No contact, but race as hard as you like, you two. Love that, love to hear that from yeah. teams. Yeah, uh, yeah, and the reason, of course, the only reason that they're battling now is because the number three car, of course, was. Uh, had had the incident up at the roller coaster, so it's kind of fallen back into the clutches of the other guy. But to look over oh, the Ford too, that was involved as well, wasn't it? The three and the, and, the, and the 66. So that's why we've all all of a sudden got a battle again there uh, between these four. Coming down to 30 minutes, half an hour to go. Got to be careful in the fight. These two guys, they both want to be on the podium for sure, but the Fords are just lurking in behind there. And what we don't know, of course, is who can go full rich. Can they all go full rich to the end and full power? You'd think so. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd think so. Yeah, no question. Two Porsches now can start to do a bit of fuel saving at the front of the field. Not that I think they need to do that in terms of getting to the end. Tandy, first of the stoppers to get to the end of the two Porsches at least, so the 911, second in the Drivers' Championship at the moment, and this, they will feel, is been, has been coming for them. They'll not take over the lead if it finishes like this in the Drivers' Championship, but they will wrap up the Manufacturers' Championship for sure for Porsche, which will release those two at Laguna Seca and at Motul Petit Le Mans to race for the Drivers' Championship, those two driver pairings. Well, it'll be driver threesomes, of course, won't it, when we get to Matul Petit Le Mans. Yeah, there's 14 points be between them coming to this weekend in favour of the 912. Just look at the lap times of these relative cars. The number 912, having been struggling the latter stage of its last stint, doing 42s at best, it's now doing low 41s. I mean, a 41-1 last time around for Earl Bamber, so he has reduced the deficit. It was four seconds when they came out after all the pit stops were completed. It's now two and a half last time around. Yeah, they're both hitting some traffic here, some GTD traffic, so see how this kind of affects their lap times and maybe brings them back together depending on where they come across that traffic here. 
Yeah. Well, Twitter's lit up after the bits and pieces of contact, particularly at the top of the roller coaster. Rain line says tough call, not going to complain about a no call, but I probably wouldn't have complained if they had called a drive through for contact responsibility. Right turn, lover. I'd have given both of them a penalty. <laughs> this is not the way for drivers to behave. <laughs> uh, ben Mitchell says, I think Dirk in the Ford move to the middle of the road. It's not completely straight place of road. Garcia locked up and hit the back of him. Yeah. Keep the... And the key, though, is he locked up. Yeah. He was trying to get out of the way, I yeah. think. He, he, he'd be... Yeah, I think he'll... he'll, uh, but not he'll, admit, it, he'll admit it was a mistake, yes. but it wasn't an egregious mistake. He didn't do, it wasn't a bump and run, let's put it that no, way. It no, it wasn't. At least yeah, it wasn't no, intentional yeah. bump and yeah. run. Yeah. Unlike, unlike a couple of incidents we've seen earlier. <laughs> Incident responsibility <laughs> doesn't say deliberate in that, but OK. Yeah, no, uh, fair comment. Uh, hashtag Michelin PRT. That might be a talking point later on. Checkered flag is the end of the race, the start of our conversation. We'll kick one trickler here. For a little while to have a chat, we'll have Shea chipping in with some driver interviews. And Jeremy and I, with your questions, please, at IMSA Radio, hashtag Michelin PRT for post-race tech. I have a strong suspicion we're not short of talking points here this weekend, not from just this race, but also the Michelin Pilot Championship, the Challenge Series as well. Uh, and also, well, we've still got 28 minutes to go yet. Plenty of things could happen between now and then. Sun's coming out. Got proper shadows behind the cars now. Warmest it's been all day. I wish we'd see some of these GTD cars, to be honest. We haven't seen them for a long time, have we? It seems to me. Maybe uh, I'm looking... At... You've been looking down. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the top four absolutely together. BMWs in GT Le Mans not been on the pace this weekend at a track that they have done well at in the past. And that'll be some concern and disappointment to Rahal Letnam and Lanigan. Meantime, on the back straight, the South Pits. This is, that must be the, the car with the, the Lexus with the battery problems again, because there's no headlights on. So that's the 14, isn't it? That's Hawksworth's car. And that's come to a halt. And I think he's given up the unequal struggle there. The Nissan uh, Titan Estate, that's uh, Titan pickup truck has pulled up. He's in a safe place there. Yeah, Hawksworth has just turned everything off. There's an air of resignation in the eyes of Jack Hawksworth, man from the north of England. And battery's gone. What he said to the safety worker who was there quickly. Right across the line, Jeremy, ask and thou shalt receive. Here comes the wins AMG GT3 down towards the first corner. Break. Ease the car into the apex. Why am I talking about this? Owen Trinkler, you know this track. <laughs> Let's uh, talk us through it as he's driving through. It's a shame we're not on the onboard all the time. Now going up through uh, into, the... Into that car, yeah. Turn yeah. three into turn four here as we head into uh, 5A, 5B is what we call the snake here. As we're back on the onboard with uh, the NSX here. Full power here on new tires. It's it's flat out all the way through this right hand turn, but they're probably just a little bit of lift, put a little weight to the nose. We're headed up under the Nissan bridge, top gear as we get up to uh, the turning point for the S's flat out. So you're going to go way left here and then set it up over the curb. Use as much curb as you can back to the right. And the car kind of gets in the middle of the road here, just a little bit of brake down a gear and uh, back to power through Sunset Bend as we head into Oak Tree here. Uh, just a little bit of brake, car gets really light where uh, where they are right now, and then turn it into Oak Tree, and then back to the power hard as you can. So down Madison Avenue, you get your Kindle out, read a couple of chapters of your favorite book. Up through the gears here, just cruising along, check your gauges and make sure of, uh, everything's good to go as we come down uh, Madison Avenue up over the rise here. What I can never get right is where's your braking point? for the top of the hill, because there doesn't, I mean, there's marker boards. What are you looking at, the one board there? Oh, we're like past the one board, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah, we're, we're way in there, past the one board there. And as we come down the roller coaster here, use as much curb on the left as you can. Just a little bit of brakes as we come into hog pen, not much. And I want to be back on the power before the car lands down into hog pen. And that settles it down, so you've got the, the weight on the back end, and that's pushing you down for the final part yep, of the right hand. And that's a long straightaway, too. The straightaway starts there all the way down into turn one. I mean, people don't realize it's just because it's got this bend in it coming into the horseshoe here into turn one. It's so long from the time that you go full power in hog pin till you get to the brake zone in turn one. 
And this is the biggest, looking from the, the tail end here of Tony Villander's car, fourth in the train. That's the biggest lead that Jerome Blekemon had has had uh, since the round of pit stops, or since he took the lead after that round of pit stops, when he uh, muscled his way past the number 86 Acura. Jeremy, how close do you think the 33 car is? I mean, is it good to go on fuel? It's 55 minutes when it pitted. I mean, or yeah. how close do you think that they, they're cutting it here? Uh, I would imagine they, 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 they knew they could get to the end from there. The, the, other, the other four cars, number 9, 86, 73, and 57, all came in a couple of laps later. Uh, but um, I would think they would be pretty confident to be able to get from there. Uh, you, 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 can't, you can't bank on there being caution periods here like you can no. with some other tracks or you can gamble or maybe on, on yep. there being some caution. I don't think you can do that here at VIR. Yeah, so. not, definitely not question Bill yeah. Riley at all. I just didn't know on yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the GTD on if they can go 55 minutes or they're at 50 minutes. Uh, well, yeah, well, we'll find out. Yeah, we're going to find but, out but today. Knowing well. Bill, I, I would have thought that uh, he wouldn't have come in um, but unless there's a mis miscalculation earlier in the race, I, I would have thought he would have come in when he knew from where he could get to the finish. The, yeah. the question is, yeah. can he go full pelt to the finish and full rich? Because there's a right. difference between saying, right, you're going to have to do a bit of lifting and coasting and fighting off guys behind it. And that comes down to track position there. And, and we're, we're talking very fine margins here. Yes, there's a run downhill, but the start finish, the run to the start finish line is long. It, and it's uphill. And it's uphill. Yeah, once you've come over that little rise, you do not want to cough and a splutter coming out the final corner. Oh, by the way, I've also noticed that Andy Lally has found a way past Townsend Bell. That's no mean feat, is it? Uh, a little while ago <laughs> today. For, for seventh position. We've got this string of four cars here in the battle of the lead for GTD. Uh, and then there's a long, long gap back to long, 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 Patrick Long, that would be, in fifth position, number 73 car. He's about, that's about 20 seconds between them. Another 10 seconds or so back to the McLaren of Paul Holton. Then a similar gap back to Andy Lally, who's running seventh in the Lamborghini for Magnus Racing, car number 44. Uh, he's uh, just ahead of Townsend by, by a second or so, and Catherine Legg's not too far behind uh, him either. Uh, let's go to Shea Adam, who has, by no means, I mean, we need to make this absolutely clear, has no, by no means has she intimated that either Jeremy or, or indeed Owen are questioning Bill Riley, but she has asked the <laughs> question. I, I said, can he go full ridge to the end? And Bill said, no, we're actually saving fuel right now. Uh, he has pulled out a gap and they're saving fuel. And he said, we're good to the end, but he is going to do a little bit of conserving during this period of the race. Yeah, well, there that's you go. fine. That's fine. I mean, yeah. yeah, he got himself out in front. That was always important to get that track position, get Correct. in front yep. early on, and then he can kind of control the pace because the GTD cars are so closely matched. If you, you, can, you can save a little bit of fuel, not go completely 100% qualifying pace the whole time, save a little bit of fuel, but still keep ahead of the guy you're racing with. Uh, and that, that was one of our Porsche keys to the race, wasn't it? Track position, one of the three P's. That says patience when passing, yeah. passing and, and track position. And Bill Bride, he's done his numbers right to get him out there. And they've traded that off. So much in motor racing, Owen, is a compromise, a trade-off. They've traded off another couple or three seconds of fuel to be able to go full rich all the way at the end, to be a second, a second and a half right now, controlling the race. And he's not yet been under pressure, so he doesn't have to push that hard right now. No, and the best place to save fuel is out front, so you can yeah, control exactly your pace right. and stuff. And so it, and the BOP is so close, like Jeremy yeah. was saying, and GTD, that, uh, you know, it's just, the Mercedes doesn't have great top-end speed, but it's got great mid-corner speed, kind of like we do in our GT4 car. And so the best place for him to, is put his car out front. He can run the pace that he wants to run. He can set the tone of where he needs to be. So that was a great call about Bill to do that. That's why I kind of talked about it. 55 minutes I thought would be kind of cutting it yeah, close. Yeah, me too. Me yeah. too. Um, but, but get him out front, save a couple, you know, save some fuel there for a lap or so where he needs to do and it's uh, not like he was an hour and five minutes which would have been pottering around in third oh you need to caution at that yeah, point yeah, 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 yeah exactly, I mean, exactly it, right. i knew he yeah. wasn't going to cut it that like no exactly that big margin but just uh, maybe a you know a half a lap or so just to get him in that window where he could get the track position and get out front I, I, i've, I've got to say it's not the worst thing either to have Mario Farnbacher behind you, who's leading the championship, Jeremy, because uh, right now, as we've got a full course yellow, full course yellow. Ah, now, what's happened here? I'll go back to that point. We've got a safety vehicle on the circuit, two safety vehicles on the circuit. Somebody's gone off on the uphill, have they, at the right in front of the Villas. 
And they're scrap. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody's been. Oh, oh, it's a 57. It's Catherine Legg. And she's been off. Now, she was battling with Andy Lally. No, no, she, no, no, no. That was that was a long time ago. She was uh, trying to tra chase down Townsend Bell. She was about a second. She's out the car. Good. That's the good news. Yeah. Out the car on her own. She's dislodged tyres right in front of the Villas there and bent the arm court. That's a very fast part. Just coming up over the top of the rise. Turn 9, 10, South Bend, Sunset Bend area. And that is going to be a clean-up required. Catherine's already taken her helmet, her balaclava off. The safety team already there. Full course caution number two. Now, Catherine saved a big incident earlier on in the weekend when they had a suspension failure, suspension part failure on that car. And she managed to keep the car out of the wall and get it back to the pits. It's tore off the left front corner off of it. Completely. Completely, all the front bodywork's gone, but the left front upright and hub has been torn off. I can't even see where that's gone, actually. I think it's actually in the tyre stack yeah. as it's gone in. So that car, for my money, that car has just gone off pretty much straight off and left side has made contact. Looks like it might have gone under the tyre stacks and hit the arm core, certainly it's deformed the arm core a little bit. That's going to need some remedial work there. Yeah, race control say this is going to be a short yellow. That, uh, what they mean by that is that uh, the pits are not going to be opened within the final half an hour Correct. of the race. So uh, it'll just be the, but, yeah. but it will be it won't be a short yellow, unfortunately, because this is going to be quite a lengthy track repair. There is a very straight line of uh, grass cutting traced to the scene of the accident. So that again may mean that there's been a technical issue. But Catherine was pushing to chase down the cars ahead of her. We've got the back loader coming in as well, the back hole coming in to straighten things out. Already track services there with some new banded tyres. That's really impressive. Spoke earlier on this weekend about the desire from race control to get the race back under green flag conditions. There's the wheel now and tyre. It's been ripped off the MSR NSX. And that's going back to the car. Catherine starts Derek A. Derek's A. He, out of the car, Derek. She's out of the car and got out of the car on her own. She's walked over and been speaking to the medics. So that's good news. The pass around will start in a moment. We're under 17 minutes. Well, they're wasting no time here, are they, with the track no. repairs? That's a magnificent effort. No, and it's, it's been like that all weekend, yeah, hasn't it, Jeremy? It yeah, really has. Been busy. They got through a lot of, lot of tyre stacks this weekend. Yeah, kudos to everybody here. I mean, Catherine's yeah. okay from that. that. That's the main concern. But yeah. uh, the, the track here, uh, led by Kerrigan Smith, has done a great job here. Even during our race yesterday, the, this... Uh, trailer was there with the stack of tires and the mess that was down in hog pen that they were right on it cleaning it up and getting everything ready to go again i've been talking um all over the weekend owen about the the passion that there is in race control and at the tracks that imza go to for racing it just as much as as we have as any of the spectators have as any of the drivers have and, and they don't want to be yellow any longer than they need to if there's the opportunity and it's safe and, th and it has to be safe first to go back for a lap or a couple of laps, they'll absolutely bust it open to get that done. You know, it was our conversation with Bo at uh, breakfast this morning. Yep. If he can go back green, he's going to go back green. And yep. in our races, the last two events, unbelievable finishes, uh, went back green for one lap to go. Yep. So uh, I, I love that they want to go back green and not try to finish under yellow. Um, main concerns, the driver's okay. Make sure that's all good to go and the track's good to go back green, but I'm glad that they do the quick service that they get done and then we can go back race and finish under green. That's what the fans come here to see. Yeah. And uh, and just think about if we finished under yellow in those two events, the fantastic finishes that we were... We would have been denied. Yeah, yeah. Been denied Bob Barfield, by the way, is who we're talking about, uh, race director for the IMSA Weather Tech Sports Car and he, Championship. He also said he came in for a bit of flack from a few people because because of those last-minute last, yeah. last minute restarts that the green-white checkered uh, scenarios, uh, it, it does have a propensity to, to for some other incidents to occur on that last lap, which you know can cause a... Cause uh, 
cost a lot of money for some people, and it has done to do each of the last two races. We're but, here to race, though. But we're here to race. That's exactly right. And, and yeah, those sort of incidents can happen any time yeah. during a race. That's his point, and he's absolutely right. I guess I don't need to say it to my team owner sitting over the back of my right <laughs> shoulder here. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. But we're here to race, so no yeah. matter what. <laughs> Just a little You'll be foot. Digging, dig deep next time, Owen. That's right. Just a little footnote that did also see a photographer being looked at by the trap medics. Uh, some suspicion that he might have been between the arm core and the catch fencing there, but he was still on his feet as well. So we'll try and get some word on everybody's condition there. Catherine will be taken, after an incident like that, every, everybody involved will go back to the infield medical center just for a proper check over, that standard operational procedure. So the ambulance pulling up there is nothing to be overly worried about. And as soon as we get the official word from IMSA, and they are very, very good indeed in letting us know, uh, we'll find out what's going on. Left rear damage on the car, of course, from earlier on on that car. Catherine Legs, 57, on the uh, Heinrich Racing car. And we wish her the best. Bit of work for the team then before they go out to California. Their other car leading the championship, sitting in second position at the moment. Time ticking down, but still 13 and a half minutes to go. I fancy we'll get seven or eight minutes of racing here. If we can get those tyres put back straight. Five minutes more of work, and then they'll clear those guys away. Pits will not open here. That'd be pretty impressive if they can do that in five minutes, I think. John, there's a fair bit of uh, shuffling around to do there, plus... Oh, it's not far to get those vehicles out of the way. They can go get, over get them onto the pit course, course yeah. and then they'll double back around to underneath us True. here. Uh, the Nissan GTR, which has done safety car duties here for a little while now, is heading the field up. So, do we get a final dash for cash then between the two Porsches? And it brings Corvette back in, and Ford, we've paired them up again. Noah's Ark style, Porsche, Porsche, Corvette, Corvette, Ford, Ford. BMW, BMW. Now, in fairness, the 24 car, I think, has fallen off the lead lap now for Jesse Cron. Yeah. Yes, it has. But the other seven are still on the lead lap. And GT Daytona, well, per many won from the top nine, really, in the finishes we've seen recently, given that uh, they're all on the lead lap, Jeremy, the top nine, down to Lawson Aschenbach, I think, in uh, That's that right. ninth position. That's exactly right. So, uh, yeah, and... The you're right. If you look at the, the laps they've they've been turning, uh, yeah, I think uh, Blakemon, as, we, as we've uh, as we've kind of documented, number 33 car has looked super strong this weekend. It's been, I think, measuring the pace there for Jerome Blakemon Jerome Blakemon after making that pit stop with with what was it 55 minutes to go or thereabouts. Yeah. Um, so he, he was the, the first that and 76 car were the first two cars to make their final pit stops. So he's probably light footing a little bit but he's able to maintain that advantage uh, and I'm sure as a result of doing that he should have kept some life into his Michelin tires as well but as we've seen also through that out this entire race weekend this is not a particularly abrasive racetrack and the tires do tend to stand stand up pretty well yeah and they're going to cool off during this uh, yeah. caution period too so they'll come back to life and the uh, we're just going to be under 10 minutes to go here still so the few laps that we're going to get that should be okay on tires I think the one car did definitely benefit here uh, was the 76 they got kind of out of sequence because they I think they had a left side tire going down when uh, Plum was in it earlier in the uh, when he got hit by the uh, the Lamborghini there so I don't I think they put it right outside the hour mark just because they were probably forced to yeah and so I think this definitely helps them out to make it to the end yeah Lights are out on uh, the pace cars we're seeing here. On, wow. Uh, Told you. Yeah, so right. yeah, here we go. They're doing better than you. Than you well, by the time they get round, there'll be about eight, eight minutes to go. Yeah. So I'm, wow. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I, I normally, I, I don't like to make those kind of predictions, but these, the guys been have on been, it this weekend. They have been consistently <laughs> brilliant this weekend. They, uh, they really have. Uh, don't forget, we need your questions, please, for... Post Race Tech, Michelin Post Race Tech, hashtag Michelin PRT. Uh, let's talk about what we've seen and heard today over the weekend. We've got the start of the WEC season coming up next weekend at Silverstone. We'll have all of that live for you as well over on RS3 and our WEC season preview with Johnny Palmer in the chair. 10 o'clock 
in the evening UK time tomorrow. That's Bank Holiday Monday in the UK, 10 o'clock on RS1. Johnny Palmer and Paul Truswell, I believe, dis discussing the potential for the new uh, soccer season style, starting in the autumn and running through to the summer for the WEC calendar. And that starts at Silverstone next weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the only place to hear it all live and free on RS3 with uh, Johnny Palmer leading the WEC commentary. Martin Haven will be looking after the ELMS for us. Shea Adam has uh, spoken to MSR, who have been very gracious and spoke to us uh, spoke to us about the Catherine Leg incident. We're about to go back green. Shea, what can you tell us? Good for the team, by the way, to have spoken to us. The initial indication is that it was some sort of a tyre failure for Catherine. Thank you, Shea. Yeah, I thought that looked like a mechanical issue. Eight minutes and 48 seconds on the clock. Green flag out, great restart from the two Porsches. The BMW that's a lap down stays out of the way. The Corvettes carve their way through the two four to side by side for a moment going into turn one. The old concertina back together. What's happening in GTD? Side by side action. There's no doubt to me that that's the McLaren going down the inside. That's the 76 car. Paul Holton and Andy Lally side by side. Townsend Bell was in there as well. This could be a big shuffle around. Blinker Mullen's got the drop on the rest of the field though in GTD. The 33 wins AMG. Porsche Nick Tandy from Earl Bamba. Half a second as they went across the line. That's a decent, a very decent. Uh, Advantage straight off the bat for Nick Tandy. He'll be focusing forward now, but the two Corvettes look fairly menacing there in third and fourth position. No changes in the positions in GTD as they head up the hill. Brilliant work from track services and race control to get the track back to raceable conditions for a nearly nine-minute dash to the flag. GTT's no. warming up here, Owen. <laughs> yeah, and Patrick Long, of course, is yeah, yeah, he closed up. Yeah, and he's got a fast car underneath him. Yeah, that number 48 car that's uh, tucked in there, that is a couple of laps down with uh, Brian Sellers at the wheel of that car. Had pro problems early on. But uh, the most of the rest, all the rest of those cars are, are in the mix. Let's go see if Garcia can hang in them. It seemed like they had some short run pace with them, you know, earlier on when we had the other caution that the Corvettes could kind of hang in there for a little bit. So uh, we only got seven minutes to go, so see if they can just hang on to the two Porsches here and put just a little bit of pressure on them. Apparently not. They're all of a sudden, uh, right away, the two Porsches stretched out to uh, that's a good second over the two Corvettes. Fractionally short of a second, but uh, it's a, an appreciable six or seven car lengths, just one, one length between each of the Porsches. They are absolutely tied together here, pulling away, but this is... It's going to be an inter interesting battle between these two. Uh, in terms of uh, lap time, the, uh, the the lap record set in this race has been the number 912 car. That's a car that's currently running in second place, but they've both set times within a tenth of a second, well, just over a tenth of a second of each other. Yeah, they get to battle in too much, they'll bring Garcia right into this. True. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Just a, a quick note on Catherine Legg's incident. Initial report saying it's a tyre failure on that car. Michelin will be looking at that, of course, working with the team. There was some bodywork damage, which may have been a contributing factor there, but I will say the GTD car stood up very well to what looked to have been a high-speed incident. The cockpit area, despite having some uh, quite heavy strikes by bundles of tyres and uh, quite quick stop for that car, Catherine able to get out under her own steam. So we'll wait to hear from the team and from Michelin about uh, the cause of that. But it did look like there was uh, some kind of mechanical or technical issue with that car. It went straight off at speed, clearly. Five and a half minutes to go. Best wishes to Catherine Legg. She'll feel a bit sore in the morning from where the seatbelts did their job. Porsche, Porsche, Corvette, Corvette, Ford, Ford, BMW, BMW. That's GT Le Mans, and as quick as I've said it, they've gone through four seconds between the top seven. Leading, Ben Keating's number 33, Jerome Bleakamall, and now just being closed down a little bit by the second place Acura NSX, going across the line now. The Winds car, followed by the Auto Nation car, then the Plaid Porsche, then the WeatherTech Ferrari. Tony Vlander in with a bit of a shout here, as well as the dark grey number 73, Park Place Porsche, Pat Long. The Californian in that car. 
GTD still battling. GT Le Mans, can we, can we possibly see Tonio Garcia get close enough to the Porsche to put some kind of move on them? Demon late breaking from Tonio earlier on. He's keeping the second place car in sight. Tandy just stretching away a tiny bit. Only just over half a second between second place and the first of the Corvettes. Then his teammate about the same behind. And watch out for the first of the four GTs, the light blue and red number 67. Richard Westbrook, is he the man most likely at the moment, Jeremy Shaw? Well, I don't know. That, I mean, all these cars, again, they're, they're pretty closely matched. The, the Porsches have definitely got the legs on everybody, though, in this race. They're the only cars to have lapped under 1 minute 41 seconds. And I expect that to continue to the end of this race. But between the Chevys and the Fords, very, very little to choose between them. Got to go for it now. This has come down to, to not making a mistake now. You've got, to be, you've got to be fast and perfect. At the moment, it uh, looks with these cars equidistant as though there's not much going on. But Owen Trinkler, this is where drivers earn their money. It's just as intense as being door to door with someone because you know you cannot make even the tiniest of mistakes here. There's, it, it's not just like Res Westbrook can, oh, I'll break a bit later and I'll get on the throttle a bit earlier because they're all right on the ragged edge of adhesion. Yeah, th these are just qualifying laps on old they tires are. here at the end of the run here, and you just got to push as hard as you can. Both classes here, any little slip up, yeah. any power down issues, whatever you got going on here as the tire deck goes on through the run uh, is going to give your competition to get door to door with you here. Yeah, so it's as hard as you can go. Uh, absolutely right. I mean, that was 1 minute 41.2 last time around by the race leader, Nick Tandy. That was a great lap. By Nick, the, uh, the, the pole time here was a 1 minute 40.6, so just a half a second outside of that. It's a great lap by Tandy. Always good to be in the lead at this point. Tandy's got a clear lap ahead of him. He's got to not think about what's going on behind him. But if you're not first, and let's say you are Westy, you've got a target in front of you. Does that help you in terms of trying to chase down the car ahead when they're this close? I don't know if it helps you, but I mean, he had, the biggest thing is that uh, you know, Tandy's got the clean air is really what you want. He got the downforce here, which you needed in the high speed turns here that the BIR. But I mean, Westy's going to be pushing here. I mean, you're all pros here. So at yeah. this point, you really don't need to wrap it out there to, you know, for you to go any harder. You're going to go as hard as you can, no matter what position you're in. Yeah, if you're out in front, you've got no distractions. Yeah, it's distract just down to yourself. So, yeah. No well, excuses either. Yeah. Well, the worst thing about chasing somebody is, particularly when you're all pushing so hard, is that the, if the guy, if you're watching the guy in front and he makes a mistake, you can quite easily follow him off because you get target sure. fixation, don't you? Yeah, you could have that, but I mean, it's uh, most of the guys here are going to be okay with that. 41.1 that time oh, for Nick Tandy, just great driving here. Uh, uh, once again, he pulls out another couple of tenths of a second over his teammate Earl Bamba. Which Richard Westbrook looking to make up a position fifth. He has fourth he wants. Sorry, a bit of Yoda commentary there. Uh, 90 seconds to go as oh, oh. the McLaren that had been going so well. A little bit of a spin. He dies with Andy Lally. That was coming out of Hog Pen onto the start finish line. And that was Paul Holton trying to make up some places on the restart. And I think he had done actually. Uh, he had no, he was, no, he still, had, be, he was uh, still behind Patrick Long. Right, okay. He dropped a couple there though, hasn't he? Yeah. No doubt. So, coming up next on IMSA Radio for our worldwide audience will be Michelin Post Race Tech. Get your questions in. Hashtag Michelin PRT. And at IMSA Radio, please, we'll discuss that afterwards. Plenty to talk about here. A lot of people talking about how good the safety teams have been here this weekend. Also talking about that new Corvette. Will it be able to be running? I think it's going to be white flag this time around as the time. Well, let's see. Time it's ticking be down. Flag time. Be white flag. Yeah, well, yeah. I tell you what, Tandy's pushing hard, and I'll tell you how I know he's pushing hard because you're actually seeing a little bit of rubbing from the left front. Yeah, the, the tires, compression, at the pen, compression yeah. at hog pen for yeah, the last two said. or three laps. White la flag is out, and the time will elapse in 10 seconds' time. So we're going to give you something in the region of 2 hours and 42 minutes, a 140.7 for Tandy last time around. And a 148, 140.8 for Bamber as well. Absolutely superb laps by those two. They're just the fastest lap of the race, a 140.638. That was by Bamber, but brilliant laps there by 
Nick Tandy. Well, there's been a couple of moments of brilliance, hasn't there, from Nick Tandy right at the start of the race when he drove around the outside of everybody to get into second, and that set him up. And now again at the end, and Tony Vlander's on the podium. Vlander has pushed up, and it's the Faf Porsche that's in trouble. It's dropping back. The Faf Porsche and Scott Hardgrove was slow there and wide coming out of the uh, out of the horseshoe. And I wonder if Pat Long's got through there as well. No doubt who's still leading. No, still fourth position for the Faf Porsche, but Pat Long's there. But VLAN has gone through. Three different manufacturers in the top on the podium at the moment as they're heading on their final lap. It's Bleaker Morland for EMG, then the Auto Nation, MSR NSX, then Tony Vlander for WeatherTech. Then it's the Porsche of Scott Hargrove for Faf. Oh, this championship's going to be very, very interesting going in the last couple of rounds of the year. And the Sprint Cup as well, which will complete its season at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Sega live on NBC Network, that next race, for those of you here in the US. Nick Tandy with two pieces of absolute brilliance. Outside pass at the start to get the second and then pulled the pin on the restart. Great pit work. 9-11 wins it for Pele and Nick Tandy. Championship leaders Earl Bamba and Lawrence Vanter pegged back by a few points, but it's a Porsche 1-2. And Porsche are manufacturers champions for 2019 in GT Le Mans. An equally brilliant team effort for the 33 and the wins AMG. Ben Keating doing a super job when there was mayhem around him earlier on. Handed the car over to Bleaker Ball and unmarked. Great pit work and strategy from Bill Riley and the rest of the team. And Keating and Bleaker Ball and win GTD at VIR. The last time we'll see those guys here for a wee while. Yeah, that's been a long time coming. They worked super hard, that team. That's the sixth different manufacturer to win in GTD this season. Brilliant performance by that entire team, as you say. That's thoroughly well deserved. They've had a couple of wins that kind of snatched away from them for different reasons. Congratulations, Patrick Pile. With this win, you become the winningest driver in GTLM. Since the merger, you now have 12 victories, and Porsche got the manufacturer's championship. So it's an all-around pretty good day. Yeah, I mean, it's it's perfect day. Uh, we have a tough uh, quali for Nick. He, uh, he went off. He was really pissed, but I tell him, never give up. Uh, we have a great car. Uh, the guy make an excellent job. All the Michelin tires was working perfectly on, on our cars this weekend. And uh, yeah, Manufacturer Championship was the first first step. So this is done now. We can we can fight until the end with our uh, sister car. We make a great job also today. It was a great fight with them. And yeah, we will try to make their life a bit more difficult for, for the driver championship. Even if it's not easy, we will never, never give up until the end. But yeah, it's a great day for Porsche. Congratulations, Patrick. Thank you. Very excitable, Patrick Pele. Apologies for the slightly colorful language there as they have got their win in the bag an inch closer to the win total of their teammates. Now, they've won the long races before now. This is the first of the sprint races that they have won. We'll let uh, Shea try and hustle down to the 33 squad where Ben Keating and Bill Riley are already celebrating their GT uh, Daytona victory. Owen Trinkler, you've been with us right the way through. As far as Porsche is concerned, a perfectly controlled and paced race from Porsche. They had the pace on the field. They still had to execute and did. Nick Tandy and Patrick Pele combining brilliantly and two fantastic pieces of driving from Nick Tandy at either end of the race. Yeah, what a great performance by Porsche that, uh, here today at VIR. I mean, they just weren't going to let the strategy get, get away from them like they have the last couple of races. So they had the pace today. Looks like the car was just brilliant over the bumps and uh, especially out of Oak Tree. It just go right over the curbing and uh, just didn't miss a beat at all. Put the power down so brilliantly and uh, just what an awesome win. I mean, they just dominated today. You drive the GT4 version of the AMG GT. The GT3 has, has won here today. Hats off to Ben Keating and to Jerome Bleakamorlan. But Bleakamorlan can't do that if Ben Keating doesn't get the car to him in perfect condition in absolute mayhem going on. Well, there was all kinds of stuff on. going on. Like He was in the middle of that tornado that was going on with the five or six cars that were battling there in GTD, and Ben did an awesome job. And those guys have been fast here. They just had different things happen here the last couple of years where they couldn't be on the podium and, or win the race. And they uh, did the right call. Bill did the right thing they need to do is get the track position, get uh, Jerome out front, and then just set sail from there. 
total team performance there. Oh, We've yeah. seen it from Br your brilliant. guys and yeah. uh, Ted yeah. Giovannis Motorsport before. That's very reminiscent of what your guys do. It is. It's just, uh, it, I mean, even Porsche, Bill Riley, it's all uh, team performance here. It's the drivers, it's the crew, everybody involved. Uh, you don't win races just with the drivers. You win races with everybody. Well, Ben Keating, the last time you won this race, you got a nice little ring for winning the Oak Tree Grand Prix. This time, you get a nice little Michelin Man trophy. Almost as good? Uh, it, it may be better. It has to be better. You know, I, I think we got third place here a few years ago, and uh, of all the trophies on my trophy case, the, uh, the little metal Michelin Man, the little metal Bibendum, has got to be my favorite. So I'm very excited uh, that uh, he's going to have a friend up there with him. Well, and a gold one instead of a bronze one, so that's even better. Woo! Congratulations, Ben. Thank you. A very happy Ben <laughs> Keating there, and rightly so. Blake and Morland did a bit of extra racing this weekend down at South Boston Speedway in the late model, qualified sixth for that, and was uh, running solidly in the top 10 before he had some technical issues. Uh, but he has done really well, and gets out of the car, and he's just taking the helmet off at the moment. We'll get a chat with the winning drivers uh, as soon as we can. Jeremy Shaw, meantime, is doing a bit of quick uh, arithmetic, so I'll leave him to that for the moment with a reminder of your questions, please. At IMSA Radio for uh, Michelin Post Race Tech, hashtag Michelin PRT. Still waiting for an uh, official word on uh, Catherine Legg and uh, the, that incident and the potential of a, a photographer there who was... Uh, involved in that as well but look to have been walking around that's good news and we'll get you the details of that as soon as we can jeremy how are you doing with the numbers what would you like to go with first you tell me uh well let's do gtd then if you've let's got do that gtd yeah. uh, the, uh, the the season long championship but mario farbacker and trent Hinden already came in with a, a huge lead it's now even huger uh, <laughs> Uh, Zachary Robichaud will, I think, move ahead of Bill Arblin and Robbie Foley into second place, but a long, long way behind in the in the season-long championship. However, in Sprint Cup, mm. uh, Zachary Robichaud will extend his lead. It was five. Oh no, excuse me. He won't extend his lead. He will. He will still lead on 175. I reckon, though, with a second-place finish today, Trent Hindman and Mario Farbacher, the overall championship leaders, will be just one marker behind, 175 to 174. With one race to go. This time out. Race to go so whoever finishes ahead of the other will win that in the manufacturers in the sprint cup for gtd uh, porsche came in here with a two-point edge over lexus that will now be a five-point edge i believe uh, over lexus with acura three points further back there in the season long championship for the manufacturers acura uh, lead coming in here and will continue to do so. 242 for Lexus, 234 for Lamborghini. Porsche on 231 will move one point ahead of Lexus into third place. GT Le Mans. Yeah, GT Le Mans. Uh, Porsche win the championship. Porsche win the championship. They, they, they'd already they were done close it except, to it anyway, except yeah. for the shouting. Yeah. They, all they had to do was start. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's done and dusted. In second place, uh, Ford will uh, still lead Chevrolet, but rather than by eight points, it'll now be by by uh, by six. In the, in the Drivers' Championship, 280 points now for Vanthor and Bamba to the 269 of today's race winners, mm. Pile and Tandy. So just 11 points between them. Jan Magnussen and Gar Antonio Garcia with a third place finish will move back ahead of Richard Westbrook and, and, and uh, Ron Briscoe. Uh, Magnus and Garcia will be 10 points behind Pile and Tandy for that to get 10 points from second to third. Uh, and don't forget that Sprint Cup final uh, race is the next race of our season. It's live on NBC Network for those of you in the USA, and that'll be at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. The rest of the season, the full season, and of course the Endurance Cup will all come to a head at Mortel Petit Le Mans in early October. Shea Adam is down in the scrum uh, at the Victory Circle. Shea, have you been able to uh, hunt down any of the drivers for us? Yeah, actually, uh, Jan Magnussen was kind enough to walk over, and he said it's not exactly what they came for, but Jan, it still moves you back up ahead of the pesky forward in the championship, so you've got to be happy with that. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's a uh, podium. It's, uh, it's great for the championship, but uh, we are so hungry for a win, and... Uh, but the team, team did great this weekend. 
car was fantastic all the way through. We had an exciting qualifying yesterday. Some good racing t today. There was a small uh, miscommunication between uh, Antonio and, uh, and Mueller. But uh, yeah, came, it, it both came back from that. And yeah, on the podium is great, but we want to win. And congratulations also on Kevin's wedding recently. Thank you. It was a fantastic weekend last weekend as well. Yeah, it looks like that was a lot of fun. I like that. Uh, I'm going to use that one in future. If I ever get called for contact, it was a miscommunication between me and the guy that I fired into. <laughs> oh, Trinkler's writing that down and storing that I up. I got to use that one to Bo. Yeah. Barfield there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, yeah, Magnussen, philosophical as ever, Jeremy. Not what they came for, but they'll, they'll move ahead of their Ford. That mighty battle between Ford uh, and uh, Chevrolet Corvette. Uh, in the drivers the championship as well but they're desperate for a win it's been a long time since they've been on the top step of the pub and then particularly of course for 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 Jan and for Antonio Garcia who managed to win a, a championship uh, without winning uh, a race yeah it's been really frustrating for for those guys I mean they, they come so close so many times they've had I think uh, what seven or eight uh, front row starts since they last had a win so we yeah, are somewhat frustrating for Magnus and Garcia in terms of the GTD championship, uh, did, you said they are leading by more now. So Mario's just uh, Mario Farnback has stretched his lead in, in GT Daytona yeah. after that uh, after that victory shit. By how much though? I want to be able to oh. give him a number. All yeah. right, okay. If you don't mind, Jeremy. We'll do oh, that. Okay. We'll do that quickly. You get cracking. Okay. Well, I've got good news for Mario, but I can't tell you just quite yet how much you've stretched the championship lead up to. But that battle at the end with Jerome Blake Mullen, were you having fun driving with your old uh, rival out there on track, your old teammate? Uh, yeah, basically I was uh, biting my finger as my own because uh, he was pretty quick. And uh, in the beginning he had to save fuel and I tried to keep up with him, but uh, he was pretty strong the whole time. Uh, but I could, or I tried to do my best to stay on him and maybe took my chance at one point, maybe with traffic or something, but uh, in the end he, he was stronger than us and uh, I knew I, I didn't, or he probably knew that I didn't want to do a lot of risk for, because we were working for the big one here and uh, obviously today was a really good day for us. And a really bad day unfortunately for Turner Motorsports, which means that the gap has stretched 37 points now for you and Trent Hinman going into the next round of the championship. Your advantage. Uh, congratulations on that. And two years in a row, a podium here at VIR. Thank you. Yeah, really, really have to thank the crew guys. We had a rough uh, start into the weekend. Uh, we've been a bit, a little bit lost uh, the, the first two days. And uh, we t today and yeah, yesterday in the qualifying, we made a big, big move forward. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, good stuff. That championship edging closer and closer, but still got to deliver that in the last couple of uh, rounds. Magnificent stuff here at VIR. A big crowd on hand to see plenty of action uh, and uh, a little bit of controversy as well and a few incidents, but mainly great racing. Owen Trinkler, thank you very much for, for being with us. This is a track that you know and love very well. It produces good racing. It's produced this weekend. What a fantastic weekend of racing. Uh, all this IMSA series that were here. Uh, kudos to uh, VIR and the crew here for getting all the cleanups done when we did have cautions uh, to get us back to green flag racing. If there's uh, our listeners out there, if you haven't been to VIR, get here next year and come watch this race. Jeremy Shaw and uh, Owen will stay with us as we head uh, to our post-race tech show with a reminder that we've got uh, a couple of races for you next weekend. Uh, we've got Silverstone on RS3 for the start of the WEC season, plus the ELMS race on the Saturday and the Barcelona 24 hours on RS1. Uh, we'll be back with IMSA content for you on RS2, live content for you from WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. That race is live on Network NBC here in the United States. Michelin post-race tech, next live from VIR.
you. I think that's the correct way to start this, as has become uh, the uh, general consensus down through uh, this season of IMSA Racing. We're live at VIR. Shea Adam, I think, is still with us down there. And we'll cheer. Are you still there, Shea? Yeah, hello. Excellent. Chip, excellent. I'm running out of interview subjects, though, because I keep calling him up to the podium. Ah, uh, how... How uh, inconsiderate uh, of them. Uh, Shea's still with us, so is Jeremy Shaw uh, and, of course, uh, Owen Trinkler from uh, Team uh, TGM, who has been uh, with us for the race. Uh, and uh, let's get your thoughts uh, over the, this weekend of racing and what we've just seen at Michelin PRT to... Uh, sorry, uh, hashtag Michelin PRT at IMSA 